Andy, are you there? I see you. I got a message from uh, Commissioner Maxwell that she's not going to make it. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> you know, I wonder, I got a complaint there from the letter to you that somebody w watched my TV, TV couldn't get into their computer and, you know, had a call. Is it possible to That's it. And you know, most people will be able to access the information on their computer. Okay, great. On their, you know, at the, go, uh, on the agenda website. I'm going to go start the encoder and um, start the webinar. So just consider it hot, and then I'll let you know when uh, I'm back at my chair. Okay. Have we heard from Commissioner Spellman? I have not. So he probably is still intending to be here. Why don't we wait a couple of minutes before starting? Yeah, I ran into him today and talked about the meeting tonight, so I expect to be here. Thank you. Great.
interesting at the Transportation Commission meetings, you can see, um, okay, we can do it here too. about finding out who attends. It is possible to do that. Okay, here is Commissioner Spellman. I'm going to call the November 4th, 2021 meeting of the City of Santa Cruz Planning Commission to order. Could we please have a roll call? Commissioner Conway. Here. Dawson. Here. Greenberg. Here. Nielsen. Here. Maxwell. Selman. Here. And Chair Schifrin. Here. And I understand that Commissioner Maxwell is absent uh, with notification. Correct? Yes. Are there any statements of disqualification? Hearing none, uh, we'll come to oral communications, but before we do so, uh, because I had heard that someone at the last meeting wasn't able to call in because uh, they weren't able to access the website, uh, I'm going to ask um, the clerk to put up the information for people who want to call in. Um, Okay, um, I'm not gonna, we're not going to leave that up. If anybody's listening on community TV and uh, needs to, wants to call in, write down that number right away so that you can do it because we're going to go back to, I'm going to ask the clerk to stop sharing the screen in a few seconds. Um, oral communications is a time when items not on the commission's agenda but appropriate for the commission um, can be talked about by anyone for up to three minutes. So let me ask the clerk to please uh, remove the shared screen and uh, open it up for oral communications. Is there anybody who would like to speak to the commission on an item that is not on our agenda? I see uh, Kyle Kelly. Um, as a hand up. Thank you. You have three minutes. Yeah, thank you. Hey, I just want to say thank you for approving 130 Center Street uh, at your last meeting. I wasn't able to attend, but I was delighted that you were able to move it forward uh, and to get four extra units of affordable housing. Um, so just a big thank you. That's all. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to the commission during oral communication? I guess I could check. Okay. Um, seeing none, we'll move on to the minutes of um, November 20, uh, October 21st. Are there any comments on the minutes? I did read these over. Uh, does anybody in the public want to comment on the minutes? Would somebody like to move approval of the minutes of October 21st? I'll move to approve the minutes of October 21st. Is there a second? I'll second. Um, let's have a roll call vote. Uh, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Dawson. Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Selman? Aye. Chair Schifrin? Aye. Passes unanimously. We'll move on to uh, the consent public hearings. Uh, uh, this is an application for a West Cliff pathway. Uh, could we have a staff report um, and explain? Lane, um, our consent public hearing is different from a regular public hearing. Is that a situation where I can just ask if anybody wants to have a public hearing? And if not, um, the commission uh, 
there could be a motion just to approve the staff recommendation without a staff report? Yeah, that, that's correct. This, this item, um, we believe, is relatively straightforward. We haven't had any um, concerns expressed by any members of the public. Um, so you can forego the staff uh, report if you'd like, um, ask questions. And I also, since it is um, advertised as a public hearing, rec recommend um, checking to see if there's anybody here from the public that would like to testify before making a decision. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anyone on the commission who would like to have this be a public hearing? Is there anyone in the audience and the public that would like this to be a public hearing? Seeing uh, no one, um, back before the, the commission, and is it correct, Mr. Marlott, that somebody can just make a mo motion to approve the staff report, and if that passes, that's sufficient? Motion and second? Yes. Does somebody like to make a motion to approve the recommendation to Planning Commission acknowledge the environmental determination and approve the coastal permit, design permit, and slope variance based on the findings uh, and conditions in the staff report and Exhibit A? Is there a I'll make a motion to that effect. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, just um, to, uh, before we have the vote, let me say, I went out and looked at the site and it definitely needs uh, the work that's proposed. So uh, I don't have a problem supporting the motion. Uh, Commissioner Spellman, did you want to speak to it? I don't know if we have a chance to ask a question. I just had one simple question, right? Uh, this. The damage that was done here was done in 2017, and here we are at the end of 2021. I'm curious, is this a financial uh, issue that, that took us this long, to, you know, this much time to get here, or was it more of a, a process-driven um, solution? Just curious. Thanks. We have uh, Josh Fangrid from Public Works, who's the, um, the applicant here, and, and he can speak to that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm Josh Finger, Senior Civil Engineer of Public Works. Uh, I don't know why my video is not working right now, it, but it's not. So um, uh, really, it's, it's staffing shortage more than anything else. Uh, we haven't had uh, available manpower to tackle this project at all uh, until now. I mean, this has been in design for a while, and now we've applied for the uh, coastal permits, which, entitled, which entailed obviously a archeological review and the biological review. Um, and then during the, I mean, it seems like there was one, one hang up after another. Uh, there was, then there were the fires last year, which that's, which uh, sidelined a bunch of the people doing those reports. So those were all delayed a few months. Um, but, and, and my staff has, is still down one person and we only filled uh, a, a, another spot within the last couple of months. So it's uh, it's been a challenge to get to this. Uh, I'll just uh, leave it at that. It's not so much a money or a financial thing because uh, it is uh, uh, at least partially supported by FEMA and uh, California Office of Emergency Services. So, and we've been in, in contact with them continuously throughout this whole process with, uh, with regards to, you know, extending the deadlines for getting this done and whatnot. But, but really what it is, is just there's too much work and too few people to do it. Yeah, thank, thanks for that clarification. Of course. Are there any uh, other questions or comments by commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, I just had a quick uh, question and I, I totally admit that I may have missed this, but I wonder if staff could just comment how um, this aligns with our climate climate adaptation plan and, and if, you know, we're, we're taking the route as far back as we possibly can, planning for, you know, future sea level rise, which we know is coming. So if somebody could just um, either point me in, in the direction in, in the staff materials and just say I missed it or uh, comment on that. Thanks. Well, I, I'd, be, I'd be happy to respond if, if, uh, if yeah. uh, Mr. Marlott believes I'm the appropriate person. Um, the, so, uh, so there are two. There are two comments I have to make to that. 
first of all, it, we can't really push the path back. So uh, just as a, as a brief overview of the project, the, the, the failure along the bluff side of the path was not due to, to wave action or sea level at all. It's due to uh, uh, overtopping from the uh, storms from two, uh, the, uh, February 2017 that dumped a lot of rain and were declared a disaster. It was a series of, I think, four or five storms over the course of a week, something like that. that that's what exacerbated the erosion right there. So to your question about sea level rise, uh, I, I I don't know how relevant that is to this particular project right now because this bluff is about 30 feet above the sea level right now. So, barring some uh, catastrophic sea level rise event, that, it, it, that shouldn't be an issue. As relates to pushing this far as far back as we can, as part of the the idea of this project is we're not touching the bluff face at all. To, uh, to try to, first of all, mitigate any concerns from the Coastal Commission, and second of all, to uh, stay away from what would be an overwhelmingly expensive project. So we're pushing this back, the path back towards towards uh, West Cliff Drive, and we're supporting the, the new section there will be supported on uh, up to 20 or 30 foot drilled concrete piers. So it, it should, it should, I mean, it, and hopefully it'll last the rest of my lifetime at the very least uh, and and not even even if uh, continued erosion were to occur on that bluff face it shouldn't impact it overly but so at the end of this project there will be there will have to be a guardrail along West Cliff Drive and then there will be maybe four or five feet of slope before the path that will be retained by a retaining wall that's uh, in will be poured integral with the path and the pony wall at the outside edge that will support the, uh, the railing. So it's, it, it's a fairly robust project. We could, have, we could have designed a project probably that would have been uh, a lot less expensive to, to build, but it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have lasted very long. This, this we think was gonna be there for quite a while. I don't know if that answers all your questions, but, but I'm happy to answer, answer more. Just, yeah, just a quick follow up. Um, thank you for that description. And yeah, it does look very robust. Um, and I should have been more clear. I just want to make sure that we're all continuing to think about climate impacts and it's not just sea level rise. We know that storm intensity and frequency is, is predicted to increase. And so storm surge and, and constant pounding, you know, along the bluff is something that as a city, we're going to have to continue to think about as we continue to make decisions about West Cliff, um, because um, that's something that's coming down the pipe for sure. So thank you again for the work on this and thank you for answering my question. Uh, of course, and I agree with, I agree with everything you're saying. And, and like, like you mentioned, this is a robust project and it's not addressed specifically in the West Cliff plan. Although it does embody some of the, the elements that are put forward to the plan, specifically planned retreat, you know, and uh, and resiliency in the face of, of coming uh, climate change. So, but but like I said, it's not addressed specifically, but I do believe it meets some of the the goals that that are uh, elucidated in that plan. Are there any other questions or comments from commissioners? There's a motion and a second to approve the staff recommendation on this item. Could we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Conway? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Selman? Aye. Schifrin? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, we'll now move on to general business item number three, objective development standards for multifamily housing community review draft study session. Uh, let me propose the following approach, which would be get a staff report, uh, probably a, a presentation by the consultants, questions from uh, commissioners, opening it open up to the public for public comments, and then back or uh, to the commission for consideration of an action. 
Um, so unless somebody objects, we'll move right into the staff report. Please. Great. Good evening. My name is Sarah Noisy. I am a senior planner with the Advanced Planning Division in the um, Planning and Community Development Department. I am joined tonight by our um, truly wonderful consultant team. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And we are going to, usually at this point in the presentation, I say, I'm going to run through a couple of things really quickly. I know you've had a chance to look at the materials. And what I'm actually going to say today is um, there's a lot of stuff in this package, and we are going to go through it with the detail and attention that it deserves and demands. So um, I hope you're all comfortable. I hope everyone has a beverage. This is going to be a long presentation, just to forewarn everyone at the beginning. Could I ask you to say how long you think it's going to be? Um, we are going to be in the neighborhood of 45 minutes to an hour, is my guess. <laughs> is that going to be staff and consultants? Yes. Okay, that's, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure there'd be uh, enough time for community input. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. So, um, as I said, my name is Sarah Noisy. I'm a planner with the City of Santa Cruz. I'm also joined this evening by Meredith Ruff from um, Urban Planning Partners, who's been project managing this project um, on the consultant side as well as Kristen Hall, who is a senior urban designer um, at Kristen Hall City Design, who has been so helpful and so insightful in terms of getting these standards together and interpreting the feedback that we've gotten from the community and bringing it into standards that we can implement and enforce as objective standards. So what we're going to cover tonight are we're going to do some background and talk about the community engagement that got us to this point of having some draft standards to discuss and look at. We're going to go through that draft that we have now. Um, then I'm going to talk about uh, the mixed use districts and some other uh, of the policy items that were also that are also sort of um, included right now in this package as sort of a first daylighting of these options. Then we'll have some next steps, and then of course we'll have time for feedback and questions. So our objectives this evening is that your commission understands the community engagement that's been conducted, that you understand the proposed um, draft standards and the mixed use zone districts as far as they are, you know, sort of in the preliminary state. Um, but your commission and the public can also understand some of the trade-offs and relationships between the standards and the community priorities that we heard through our focus groups and surveys. And then um, that there's an opportunity for um, direction in terms of how your commission sees further refinement being necessary of these standards. And then um, also having an opportunity for your commission to um, provide comments that will be um, that can be incorporated into consideration when we bring this item to a study session at the city council level, which will happen at the end of November. I'm going to talk about just some very quick project background. As we all recall, uh, the city of Santa Cruz has a general plan, 2030 general plan that was adopted in 2012, and our zoning does not fully implement that plan. Um, we pursued a grant to um, fund the creation of these objective standards because um, the Housing Crisis Act of 2019 states that jurisdictions must use objective standards when reviewing housing development proposals, and they further must implement those objective standards to the extent that they allow for fully realizing the planned capacity of housing on a given property. Um, there is language in there about you know, jurisdictions shall not apply standards in such a way to reduce the intensity of housing. Um, this is a, a piece that I pulled out and put in your staff report for you, um, and it includes reductions to height, density, FAR, which is a regulation of building mass, um, increased setbacks or open space, anything that would, quote unquote, lessen the intensity of housing. And then we have here our example of a subjective standard development must be compatible with the character of the neighborhood. We have very similar findings like this in our currently in our design permit findings. And then objective standards, which are um, things that can be measured and documented and um, essentially fit on a very, very easily identified as being a yes or no in terms of um, reviewing a development proposal. <clears throat> so a little more background on this project. So when the when the general plan was adopted, it envisioned a new land use pattern for the city, and it made some changes to some of the land use districts. There was an effort to implement that general plan that was not well accepted by the community. That was a process known as the corridors plan. And when that process was set aside, 
the city council gave direction to staff to um, in, begin a new process to reconcile the zoning and the general plan. And part of that guidance was that that outreach be more effective um, and that we, we consult with neighborhood groups that we prioritize protection of neighborhoods and protection of local businesses as top city priorities. So when we were writing our grant application for this project, we really had goals to have very broad outreach to make sure that we were reaching all kinds of voices about housing in Santa Cruz. Um, and then we knew we were gonna be focusing on multifamily and mixed use housing just at, at several key sites, because as I mentioned, this, the discrepancy that we have with our general plan is really focused on a few key areas um, on Mission, Ocean Street, Water, and Sotel, um, and two nodes on Brand Supporty. Um, so one of the reasons we selected UPP is that their proposal really focused on equity and social justice, which was one of the key things that we wanted to bring into this discussion about housing. Um, they were focused on well-informed participation, so in a really um, important educational component of our outreach and engagement, and they are brought in a lot of new tools. This engagement that we've been doing so far has been not entirely, but almost completely done online in the age of COVID, which has been um, a new thing for us to work with. And it's been a challenge and it's also been a really remarkable opportunity for us to pursue new ways of getting engagement and um, stretch ourselves in, in new ways. So we wanted to make sure that we had, um, so there's some goals that we set for ourselves with our community engagement were to increase inclusion of historically marginalized groups, and ensure that we were getting representative participation. So based on our census demographics, are we actually hearing from a representative segment of the population? Um, we wanted to provide education and information to the community so they could provide informed feedback to us as we were collaborating to develop these standards. And we wanted to really add to the discussion about housing that we're having currently in Santa Cruz and we'll continue to have over the next several decades. So, we went through, so we've gone through several stages. Um, you know, the last time we were here talking to your commission about this, we had done, we had completed our um, our test fit analysis and we had done that in, we had gotten some information from a focus group of developers to make sure that we were considering all of the right pieces and thinking about how, what affects the feasibility of development of multifamily housing. And we discussed the results of those test sets with you about a year ago. In the spring of 2021, we had, the opportunity to do our diversity, equity, and inclusion event, which we called Designing Santa Cruz for All. And we talked about, we had just this wonderful opportunity to really talk about housing policy that affects uh, communities across the nation and the effects that zoning has had over time and um, how those effects have not been equitably distributed among the population. So following on that event, we had our survey to define community character, and I'll be going through some of the results of that tonight. And then following on the heels of that survey, we did some focus groups to make sure that we were filling in any gaps that we had in our demographic data. So I'm gonna show you some slides from our Designing Santa Cruz for All event. Um, I'm, if you've had a chance to watch the presentation, it is on our website. And um, I, I am actually pretty proud of that work. So um, that the presentation is there if you'd like to watch it in its entirety. I'm gonna show you some of the slides that we use. I won't be going through all of this information in detail, but. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of things that we were able to um, discuss with the with the community and some education we were able to provide. We were we were joined by two um, guest speakers, uh, Gretchen Regenhart of formerly of California Rural Legal Assistance and Diana Alfaro of Mid Penn Housing to talk about some of this history of zoning and the impact that it has on affordable housing development. So this event was intended to educate people about the project and inform them. So why would we, you know, how would equity connect to objective standards? Well, you know, it does a lot of things. It creates certainty for all the participants, decision makers, community developers. Um, it li limits the ability of communities to reduce the number of units or to deny housing that should be built and that's planned to be built. Um, ideally, these set standards for high quality design and then everyone gets to play by the same set of rules. So affordable housing developers I have a, are on an equal playing field with developers that are better resourced. Why, do, why, would, why might we need some of these standards here in Santa Cruz? Well, a lot of the state legislation is really focused on production of housing units. Um, I understand that not everyone is a supply side economics uh, believer and uh, 
that's that's the direction that the state legislation is taking. There are lots of components that that fulfill a housing policy. Like I have this pie chart here that has the three P's. Um, I've also seen this displayed as the three S's, where it's um, stability, subsidy, and supply. And this project, what we're talking about, really is focusing on this production. The tool that we have in zoning and, and that we have in development re regulations really has an effect on that component. has a has an effect on how many units can be built. Um, there are lots. There are other components of a healthy housing policy, and the city is involved in many of these. Some of these are heavily influenced by state and federal policy. Um, they are all important. And what we are talking about today in terms of zoning tools is really focused on production of housing units. And um, the state is focused on this because of the existing housing shortage that we have in the state of California, statewide. You know, there are various estimates, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.8 million units needed between uh, 2018 and 2025. And um, that would be a production rate of, I think, 180,000 per year. And we've been producing between 70 and 80,000 per year statewide. So falling short of that target. We got a chance to talk about um, the racialized history of zoning. So this is um, this is a deed restriction for the Rispin Mansion over in Capitola. This was actually published in the newspaper like just a, several weeks right before the event that we held um, that identifies that there were actually racialized deed restrictions and these are common in homes around Santa Cruz County these can no longer be enforced as of, you know, 1917. You can't enforce a specifically racialized deed restriction. Um, but it sort of just demonstrates how um, housing has always been connected to social equity and, and racial components. So, yes, this can't be enforced as of 1917. But then following on that, we got into a history of redlining, which I won't go into because it's a very long story. Um, but redlining has only been illegal since 1968, which is really, that's barely 50 years ago. So um, in terms of um, patterns of development and generational wealth, 50 years is really not very much time. So all of this together, we were able to, you know, bring all this information together to talk about how does zoning, can zoning start to address racism? Um, you know, when we have a fair set of standards that apply equally to everyone, um, all types of housing have a better chance of getting built and we need all types of housing to serve all types of households. So um, we're ensuring that our processes can be more fair and then as I mentioned before we're creating a more level playing field. This is a map that shows um, uh, a representative of one dot per person for the this is based on the 2010 census we didn't have the 2020 census yet data yet when we made this map but um, you can see that certain neighborhoods are heavily concentrated, especially with our Hispanic population, which is shown on this map in orange. You can see that that's, that population is really concentrated in the lower ocean and in the beach flats area, and then a little bit around um, sort of Grant Street Park and along the Ocean Street Corridor. And those are places that are zoned for denser housing. And um, the areas that are shown in yellow on the, on the on the um, on the map and covered in blue dots, those are single-family neighborhoods that are primarily occupied by um, white families, white households. So this is how this lingers in our um, land use pattern today. So, what have state and local governments done to combat housing segregation and move towards greater diversity of housing options for all income levels? In the theory is that we have state laws that get implemented by city programs that lead to increased housing supply, and that is the um, the ethos that we have taken into this project. We are implementing a state law and the end goal is to increase the supply of housing units. Um, I wanted to also just point out to your commission, um, the state is extremely serious about this. I pulled here two screenshots from, um, the one on the left is a press release from Governor Newsom that he's, um, you know, he signed 31 bills related to housing this year. And um, he's also dedicated a, a whole bunch of money toward housing in this in the current budget, and um, you know, focused on holding cities accountable for providing their fair share of housing. And on the right, this is was just announced yesterday by the um, attorney general is that um, they are the attorney general's office is forming a housing strike force to um, enforce the state's housing laws and also in with cities and then also in terms of like tenants rights and homeowners rights 
in foreclosures and things of that nature. So the state government is getting very serious about this. And I think that we are just at the beginning of this conversation about housing and in terms of implementing new legislation as it rolls down from Sacramento. So that's a lot of background about, you know, that was sort of our first event. We got to discuss, you know, the history of zoning. And then our next big outreach piece to the community was to do a survey to define the character of Santa Cruz. So we want development that fits in with Santa Cruz as we build new housing. So let's define that. What does that mean? We got a total of 819 responses. 40 of those were in Spanish language. And we saw, so we got really great information out of this. We saw that people are really interested in having active space on the ground floor. It's sort of how that, what exactly that means to be active wasn't quite as clear, but people are interested in having like active walkable spaces, wider sidewalks, excuse me, outdoor amenities and open space. We had a lot of comments about landscaping and trees as well. We did see support for making housing development more feasible, although that was in exchange. So we had a question about, you know, housing feasibility versus reducing mass and bulk, right? And that was a pretty close question, actually. It was about 51% were in, told us that we should just do whatever it took to make housing more feasible. So definitely some concerns about, especially in the lower rise neighborhoods, how new development is going to fit in with the neighborhoods. We also heard, and this shouldn't be a surprise, but Santa Cruz is a fan of diversity in terms of architectural form, and they wanted to see a lot of freedom for architects. And then, and for the most part, these responses were relatively consistent across demographic groups. We did kind of break it down by demographic groups on several questions to see if there were major differences. And there were a couple exceptions. I'm going to talk about one right now, which is about the height of buildings. And this one broke down about, based on the language that we got our survey responses in, which I thought was interesting. So this was a, this question says, for apartments with a mix of market rate and affordable units, what's the maximum height that you support on, support on major commercial streets? So this is, you know, we're thinking about water, SoCal and Ocean Street here, and Mission to some extent. And based on the test fits, as we discussed last year, you know, we know that for these sites, especially on SoCal and water and on Ocean Street, we need a minimum of four stories to accommodate that floor area ratio that we, that we need to, you know, be able to accommodate. And so we were interested to see that, you know, when we look at all responses, which is by graph on the left, we actually have 60% of our respondents that chose something that was taller than four stories. So either five, six, or no maximum height. And yes, four stories was the, you know, plurality response. It's got a little bit over a quarter of the total responses. And 60% were ready to accept more. In Spanish language, the difference was a little more stark. So in the Spanish language response, you know, that desire for four stories was much more popular, had 41% of the responses. And also, interestingly, the answers to this question relate to that. So we had a question about what are some good trade-offs to create for, create the option for less expensive housing. And the top answer was increasing building height. So allowing taller buildings, if that can somehow affect and reduce the cost of housing, that's the option that we want to see. And that was also the true, that was also the option selected by Spanish language respondents. So there is, I think, some tension, you know, and some like, as is true in so many things about land use, there's sometimes tension. We want, we want it all. We want two things that may be hard to accommodate at the same time. So, you know, that's just sort of some, some of the information about what we heard in the survey results. We also saw there was a lot of support for having exclusively residential buildings and commercial areas, which is something that's currently allowed in our code. So that's, you know, that's interesting and good to hear. We asked about, you know, how much space for retail or restaurants on the ground floor and kind of got a variety of answers on this, but seemed to indicate that, you know, some level of activity is really desirable, especially on these, like on these corridor streets. So our 
standards do go into that to some extent. Um, so this is so in thinking about balancing um, bulk and mass of buildings and making rental housing more feasible. Because one of the things that our test showed is that especially on these lower density sites, these RL sites, or now with you know SB9 having passed R1 sites where you can develop a duplex. Um, it's kind of hard to make those pencil out, especially in a way that would support rental housing, which is typically um, a little less profitable than making than doing for sale housing. And so um, we were interested in you know, how the community thought about that. Is it should we be trying to make rental housing feasible, or should we? Is it more important that we reduce bulk and like sort of keep the building small so they fit? You know, they're harder to distinguish from the other existing single-family homes in the neighborhood. Um, and you know, we had a little over half that were much that were more interested in making things feasible. So we've done we've added some things to um, kind of help spur that along. But this is one of the things that is just really challenging to accomplish with land use. Um, I'm going to go through the rest of these kind of quickly. So other important things, even if they do increase housing costs, people were really interested in seeing architectural details and buildings with variety. Ground floor shops was another popular answer, and then more parking was also something that people would like to see. So do you prefer buildings that are uniform in, in design or eclectic? Absolutely. Santa Cruz is an eclectic place architecturally, and that's what people were interested in seeing. We also asked questions about how strictly to regulate things. Um, and I was interested to note here, there's almost there, there's nothing here that the community in general wanted the city to dictate a very tight standard about. Um, there were a few things where it, it was a more popular answer to have um, to create some options for the architects to choose from rather than just leaving it completely open. So we've incorporated this feedback into the standards that we've written. So based on the, we also asked some demographic questions with our survey to make sure so that we could um, evaluate if we were really reaching a representative sample uh, of, of the community. So we were looking for who was who missing from the, the survey response. And then we also wanted to think about, you know, based on where we do see this more, this intenser level of housing coming online as planned in the general plan, you know, who's likely to be like living in that new housing and where is it gonna be located? So um, we pulled together six focus groups. We talked to students, we talked to adults under 35, we talked to low income households, we had a focus group with renters, focus group with East Side neighborhood residents and uh, a focus group with the Chicanx, Latinx community as well. So we talked to 40 participants overall. We also did two one-on-one -on -one interviews with folks who um, lived in low-income households as well to make sure that we were hearing from filling any gaps that we had in our survey data. In general, the focus groups had similar themes to what we saw in the survey responses. With strong opinions about architecture, but very eclectic. So we, they like architectural features, but there was no strong consensus about exactly which features are preferred or a specific type of architecture that people wanted to see. Um, we also got feedback about, you know, what it's really like to, you know, thinking about development standards from the point of view of living inside the unit rather than just trying to regulate the outside of it. Um, which was really insightful and, and brought us to standards that, we, um, that we've implemented around um, security and private open space, like really moving to a preference for private open space in, in these objective standards. That's based on feedback we got through these focus groups. There was some sentiment in uh, several, of the focus, several of the focus groups that um, sometimes building heights or shadows of parking can be used to constrain housing stock and reject good projects. We heard that repeatedly. Overall, what we heard from our focus groups was that we should, in these standards, we want to prioritize affordability. We want to be looking to create livable and newer housing stock. We want to have neighborhood serving commercial uses, things that um, you know people actually need in their neighborhood, medical offices, um, pharmacies, grocery stores, hair salons, like things that people want to use on a regular basis. <clears throat> we heard a lot of comments about environmental sustainability, both for buildings and then also for transportation. So a lot of comments about 
making it easier to walk and bike, more inviting to walk and bike uh, through the city. And then we also heard a lot of comments about landscaping and trees and the importance of adding trees, maintaining trees, having access to nature as part of new development. And now I am going to hand it over to Meredith and Kristen to walk through how we took that insightful commentary from our survey and focus groups and came, uh, put it into a set of objective standards. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I'm going to walk through the standards, um, but Kristen is here, our urban designer, to, to really dig into things in the question and answer if you uh, as, as needed. Um, so before we get started, just a couple more framing pieces. Um, there are, of course, things like the siting of curb cuts and the dedication of roadway. Um, those are absent from tonight's presentation. So you can go to the next slide, Sarah. Um, the hope is they'll be included in the final package that's um, up for adoption. But for tonight, we're focusing on the building design aspect primarily. Also wanted to acknowledge that there are lots of great area plans in Santa Cruz that have varying degrees of subjective and objective standards in specific neighborhoods. And we're currently working with city staff on identifying those and figuring out which of the subjective ones we should tweak to become objective and how those will work with this package of standards that you receive in your packet. And so that's an ongoing process and one that we actually are interested in and any feedback you have. And then finally, um, we want it to be clear that these standards are a floor for building design, not a ceiling. Um, so we know you have the general plan, these area plans, the zoning code, and where they might be subjective and unenforceable, we'll have the safety net, the objective standards, to really try to ensure um, some high quality design where there might be gaps. So we have two main sections of the standards. One focused on site design, the second focused on building design, and the items in bold here are the ones that I'm going to touch on tonight. You, of course, have the whole packet and we welcome questions and discussion on any of them, but the ones in bold are the ones we heard the most feedback from on the community, and it makes sense because I think they're also the ones that are most noticeable to the average person walking down a sidewalk. So the first thing to hit on is, as Sarah mentioned, Eclectic is um, very Santa cruz -y. We heard, you know, there's um, a love for just different types of projects. As she mentioned, also prioritizing smaller projects is something that was important to people and the desire for a newer housing stock and a need for multifamily. This really came through when we did our focus groups with students and young adults. There were many of them who were living with family members and um, just wishing they could have um, a place of their own. And so in response to those um, pieces of feedback, we've done a couple things. One is trying to incentivize a stacked flat building typology. So you can think of this as like a fourplex where the circulation is shared within a building and the parking is not included in the envelope. We've proposed reducing the parking requirements by 50% for those types of buildings to try to incentivize these missing middle types. We also introduced a new housing type, uh, a live work unit, and this is a dwelling unit that includes a commercial component. The thinking is the commercial use would be dictated by the underlying zoning. And then finally, in addition to the smaller fourplex, duplex, we have standards for larger mixed use buildings, higher density apartments, townhomes. Um, so we're really just, we're trying to increase the, the diversity of housing here. Sarah mentioned this, so I won't um, go into too much detail about what we heard, but walkability was very important to people. Um, we did some interviews with people who live in senior housing projects, in addition to students and young adults and the, the full age spectrum of residents. There were people that have a car-free lifestyle. And of course, green space and landscaping is really important to the walking experience. So we have a lot of standards just around walkability. The full section 1B in, the, in this packet is about walkability. A lot of those standards are focused on creating more connectivity. So we have a, a standard that would say you cannot um, remove any existing public pathways, or if you do, they have to be relocated. The, the net number still has to remain the same. And if your project is in the middle portion of a block that's a larger block, so a block that's greater than 500 feet, you would require a new um, public connection, so a, an alleyway, pedestrian path, um, something so that you don't have these mega blocks that are just impermeable. Um, we require such pathways to connect to adjacent public ways. 
And um, finally, we would require lots of entries, um, an average of every 50 linear feet in the commercial areas. In addition to connectivity, we looked at how our ground floor design can really help um, make the environment more inviting for pedestrians and visually interesting. And so there's a whole section, section 2E, on ground floor design. Some notable things there are that in the commercial and mixed use zones, we're proposing a minimum height of 15 uh, feet for the ground floor, and there would be a transparency requirement of 70% for the majority of that ground floor really just trying to create visual interest and inviting commercial spaces that can be more viable. Uh, and then lots of standards related to circulation as well, requiring sidewalks at least eight foot wide, feet wide on the corridors, and actually 12 feet wide um, when, when you face the corridor uh, for most of the building frontage. And we also prohibit parking between the front lot line and the predominant building space and for the residential parking to be screened from view. Those are just a couple of the things we're doing to try to improve walkability. Uh, active ground floor goes hand in hand with this. Uh, Sarah touched really well on this, but we heard from survey respondents that they do want some level of activity. There was some nuance in what types. Uh, we heard some prefer retail over um, offices or lobby type uses. And we also heard in our survey that um, residential only buildings was a good trade off for less expensive housing. So kind of we're trying to balance in a couple of different things here, but what we've come up with for this draft is that in the MU districts that Sarah will tell you about later, and in the CC and RT districts, we'd require 100% active uses on the public frontage. So that's the part that faces the public street or public open space. And that would be to a minimum depth of 25 feet. And active uses you can think of as pretty much the uses that are allowed in the CC zone, except ones that are related to manufacturing or auto uses, plus um, the work units, the new unit type, and um, plus residential amenities like lobbies or gyms, as long as they meet certain requirements. Um, in addition to this active frontage requirement, we would require 100% non-residential uses on corner lots. Uh, those really have a special place in the commercial landscape. And finally, allowing the live work units on ground floors where um, residential is allowed on the ground floor in the commercial. And landscape and open space, uh, Sarah mentioned this came over, came through loud and clear in our outreach. One thing I'll tease out a little bit is that we asked in our focus groups about trade-offs between public common open space and private open space. And while we heard there's a need for both, we also heard you can find public open space in other places you know, gathering places, parks, whereas um, it's really a premium on your own private balcony or stoop. And a lot of times people said that their courtyards and their buildings weren't even used. Um, so hearing this, we did try to prioritize um, private open space. Um, that's with standard 1F1 and 1F3, which would allow you to substitute common open space for private open space at a ratio of two to one. So for example, 80 square feet of common open space could be substituted for 40 square feet of private open space. Uh, we also have a lot of standards about landscaping and trees requiring eight square feet of planted area for every 40 square feet of building frontage and street trees every 30 feet on the corridors, really in response to how much of an emphasis we heard on greening and landscaping. And then finally, we heard a desire for amenities. So we would include some programming for for usable open space. Uh, you would have to choose three, at least three out of seven options, things like shade trees or playground or public art. Uh, and then the last thing that uh, I'll touch on here is that we do propose decreasing the amount of required open space in the commercial and mixed use zones. In talking with developers, we heard that open space is really difficult in the CC zone. And given the, the desire in the community to prioritize feasibility, we are suggesting removing the 100 square foot of private open space and 150 square foot of common open space in the CC zone, changing it to be 40 square feet of private open space and 20 square feet of common open space per unit. That's something we um, will definitely be going to the community for feedback on. All of us, we will be, but that's something we do want to hear about. And we also have a standard that um, is called the upper level taper, 
And this goes back to what we've heard about sensitivity around existing neighborhoods. When asked what is the best, you know, good neighbor policy, people most commonly said that they would um, have upper story side setbacks to reduce massing impacts on adjacent properties. We heard um, just in general concerns about shadow and privacy, and then a little bit in tension with some of this, you saw that there was support for increased building height. When asked what a good trade-off is for less expensive housing, the number two answer was increased building height. Trying to put all these things together, we've come up with this policy where the uppermost story of a building is greater than four stories or greater than 90% of the allowable FAR would have an upper level taper. And so 15% of your uppermost floor would be reduced compared to the floor below it. And you can't just take a notch out of your building. You have to include a 15% reduction in the diagonal of the building too, as you can see in this diagram. And that's an attempt to really have your designer move the bulk of the building around instead of just hiding it. And uh, I'll note in that blue box here, this is something that we're being really deliberate about and getting feedback from the community. And Sarah also has some additional setbacks in the mixed use district that we're exploring. Um, but this is where we landed. And I, um, I'll just touch on the shadow and privacy impacts. We can talk about this a little bit more in the comments, but we did hear this loud and clear and we did some testing on ways to reduce shadow and we just could not find a standard that was actually effective at doing so. Um, and so we, we haven't carried that through with this draft, um, but I don't want you to think we, we just ignored it. We really did um, look at some options there. Uh, getting to the near end of my part, so hanging there. Um, for building articulation, although we didn't hear, as Sarah mentioned, a resounding favorite architectural style, I think it was pretty clear that most people disliked really boxy looking architecture. And we also heard um, that people prefer architects to be able to choose options amongst a menu of things for breaking up blank walls. And so where we landed is with standard 2C, there are three different ways that um, architects could choose to decide to break up building frontages that are longer than 30 feet. And so different projections um, sometimes in conjunction with a change in material as you can see here. At corners, that's uh, become a little bit more robust just because um, on corridors, especially the corridor corner parcels, we want to be pretty prominent. And so we once again have a menu of three options that designers and developers could choose from. And they could have a chamfered corner where the diagonal is cut off. They could create 30 square feet of open space, or they could increase the height on that corner by a three feet over the adjacent roof line. And then finally, the one, uh, the last one we're going to touch on for this part of the presentation is architectural detailing. And this was something the community really valued uh, when we asked what's important for a building to include, even if it does um, increase housing costs, they said architectural detailing. Um, but they also once again asked that things like color and decoration be left open for the wonderful architects working in Santa Cruz to decide. And so we have some standards that provide a menu of options for architectural details and building materials for people to choose from. For architectural details, it's um, a category. There's four different categories and you can choose two of those. And that's something we're going to test with the development community as well. And I think that's all for me now. So I'll pass it back to you, Sarah. Thanks, Meredith. All right. So we're getting into it tonight. There's a lot of information here. So thank you for your attention. I'm going to go through now um, some preliminary standards that we are kind of putting together to create some new mixed use zone districts. So, um, you know, one of the things that in order that we need to do in order to fully implement our general plan is that um, we, we do need to create some new zone districts. Um, oops, here. So this is a map showing the areas uh, in the city where new land use designations were created in the 2030 general plan. And these are the areas where we have conflict currently between the general plan and the zoning ordinance. These general plan land use designations are not fully implemented by the current zoning code. So we need to create some new zoning districts to do that, to implement the general plan, to bring the zoning code into consistency. So 
the current concept that we included with your packet includes six discrete zones. This happens because um, of the intersection between the standards that are set here in the general plan and then the standards that are set in the Ocean Street area plan. So um, I'm going to go through these six districts. Um, I'm going to group all of the Ocean Street ones together because they are that that one is a little bit more complicated. Just the Venn diagram of how things um, overlap along Ocean Street uh, makes things a little bit trickier. But the existing zoning that applies in you know over 90% of these parcels is uh, the community commercial or CC zoning. Um, the height for that is three stories and 40 feet. And um, currently there's no additional height for mixed use. And there are no setbacks in that zone district by, you know, as a standard. Where it's adjacent to a residential zone, they're, they're required to meet the adjacent residential setback. Um, I'm sorry, there's a mistake on the slide. This, ignore this, pretend this isn't here. This shouldn't be there. We're having a week this week. Um, okay, so I just wanted to show this to everyone so that we can understand sort of like what we're starting from. What's the change that we're experiencing? So where for in the CC zone district today, you can do a residential only property. That's an allowed use. When you do a residential only development, there is a density typically that applies to that development. It's established by based on the um, RM, the mid density multifamily designation. <clears throat> when you do mixed use in the CC, there is no general, there is no density established in the zoning code. So those are the developments that I, I think lots of us have kind of become familiar with where we get to our um, total number of units based on reviewing the site standards and how they apply on the site. So this is the context within which we are working to implement the state law, which says we cannot reduce the amount of allowed housing. So. This area shown in purple here, this is along, um, just to orient you, the, um, this is Soquel right here. Ooh, here's Soquel. This is Branta 40 and here's Water Street. So these are areas that are identified in the general plan for mixed use high density. The general plan says that these sites have a 2.75 floor area ratio and they have a density of up to 55 dwelling units per acre. Now we also have several types of units that don't have a density, that are allowed to exceed the density established by the general plan. That's all kinds of small units. It's single room occupancy units, it's studios and one bedroom, apartments and condos. Um, so what we're suggesting here for this, this is these are our preliminary thoughts on how, what a zone district, what this zone district might look like. Based on the feedback we got in the survey and the analysis that we've done, we're starting with and a recommended height of allowing up to five stories and 55 feet. Um, this, for this district, we wouldn't have a minimum height. We would allow you know, shorter buildings, of course, to be you know, however tall they wanted to be. We're in all of these mixed use zone districts, we are um, currently contemplating requiring mixed use. You know, if we wanna preserve space for local businesses, if, and we're, you know, we have direction to preserve local businesses as one of our top policy priorities, we want to make sure that there's space for businesses moving forward and that as redevelopment happens, commercial space is included so that there are places for, for businesses to go over time. Um, the setbacks that we're looking at right now um, are all kind of subject to change. So you, you'll see some asterisks on here around the height and around the setbacks. And that gets into this question that we need to get into with the community about how do we want to transition between more intense land uses and less intense land uses? What's the way to do that? And there just are trade-offs as you take, um, you know, a given volume of a building and you, if you push it further away from a property line, it necessarily needs to get taller as you do that. And so there's a trade-off to be made here between height and setbacks and how we transition. So. That is one of the key pieces of feedback we're going to be looking for with the community as part of our next engagement to review and go over these standards. So these places where you see asterisks are we we are expecting to refine and adjust in response to that to what we hear from the community about how to best manage those transitions. So as we're thinking about this now, these mixed use zone districts 
would not be governed by a density. They would be governed by a density in the general plan, which as, a, as I've mentioned, that, uh, that density number applies to um, housing units that have two or more bedrooms. And um, smaller units would just be governed by the site standards. And that sort of replicates the situation that we have currently under our mismatched general plan and zoning code. And that it's our understanding that this is the capacity that we have to um, accomplish, accomplish and accommodate. We also have seen through our test fit that um, allowing a little more height and allowing these smaller units to really, you know, max out the building envelope, that's how you get housing that pencils out. That's how you get housing projects that can really work and that can really get built. So now I'll talk about, this are the, these are sites along Mission Street. So these are designated in the general plan for mixed use medium density, which the general plan defines as having a floor area ratio of 1.75 and a maximum residential density of 30 dwelling units per acre. All those same caveats apply to density. Density applies to dwelling units with two or more bedrooms. And so in this area, we have a lower floor area ratio. So we're recommending a smaller height to start with, four stories in this location. Um, and again, no minimum height. We're gonna require mixed use and we're gonna refine these setbacks and heights based on feedback we get from the community. Um, so in terms of building typology, in this area, we're seeing more ground floor retail with three stories of residential above, whereas in mixed use high density, we're, we were seeing ground floor retail with four stories of residential above. And now we're gonna get to Ocean Street. And Ocean Street, I had to split onto two slides because it, it does get a little more complicated. So what we are trying to accommodate here um, are the, the general plan creates uses two different um, land use designations along Ocean Street. It has an MXVC, so a mixed use visitor commercial. And it also uses that same MXMD, the mixed use medium density that we have on Mission. So both of those land use designations are present here on Ocean Street. And then the Ocean Street area plan has several height standards established within that plan. So taking the intersection of height and floor area ratio meant that on Ocean Street, we actually end up with four discrete zone districts that have you know, distinct floor area ratio and height combinations. And so that's, that's the basis of this zone district type. Um, and that's why, that's why we have so, so many concentrated here along Ocean Street because of the way that these plans sort of interact. Um, the Ocean Street area plan also sets minimum height, excuse me, for structures in certain locations. So there are places the places that are shown in orange and in um, dark blue, the Ocean Street area plan actually requires a minimum of two stories. So in those areas, new development, we're requiring that to be a two-story structure. We're not allowing one-story development in those areas. Um, so, you know, the mixed use 01 and 02, those are places where we have um, a, the lower intensity mixed use land use designation from the general plan of a 1.75 floor area ratio. And then the mixed use um, V1 and V2, those have that higher floor area ratio. So that's the, the blue areas have that more intense um, floor area ratio. The orange and yellow areas have that, um, that less intense floor area ratio. And then the heights are a bit of a mix. So in these locations, the way that height and floor area ratio relate to each other um, are a little different. And so the way that we handle setbacks and setbacks in these locations is gonna have to be different than we handle it in those other areas that are designated for, for mixed use. Because when we have, as we do in the MX, in the mixed use V1, which is the, um, that light, those light blue sites, we have a high floor area ratio combined with a low height. So what that means is that those sites are gonna be harder to develop. We're gonna to need to look at reducing setbacks in order to accommodate that. And we may need to think about, um, you know, whether there are any other tweaks for specifically those sites relating to perhaps parking or landscaping or open space requirements, because it just gets tricky to fit 2.75 into three stories and meet all of the other existing standards. So. These are continu gonna continue to be refined. Um, we're gonna get some feedback from the, from the public. And this may be an area, especially this area along Ocean Street, 
that we may, as we do more work, we may kind of realize this needs to become a little bit of a phase two in terms of really refining these zoning standards because some of these areas, um, the, the way that the, all of these different standards sort of mesh and line up, um, it's not as smooth as in other areas. I also just want to mes mention um, the, the areas that are in um, yellow and orange are more sort of similar to the areas that are on Mission Street and on Soquel and Water, sort of like, you know, ground floor commercial, residential above. The, mix, the, the areas that are shown in blue are really intended to be more focused on serving visitors and creating opportunities for lodging and creating other op commercial opportunities. So um, you're going to see that when we when these um, when these zone districts come back with like a full set of zoning ordinance language, you're going to see that reflected in the way that the uses are described. That th those areas are going to be more focused on commercial, making it easier for commercial uses, and um, it may be a little less accommodating to residential. And then the the um, commercial uses that are included are going to be more focused on visitor serving here along the Ocean Street corridor. Okay. And then um, there were several other policy items that were in the package this time that we kind of wanted to just bring up with your commission at this point. Um, some of these have been very well thought through. Others are just kind of ideas that we've had and we're interested in any feedback you all might have. Um, so. I'm just going to kind of run through these. So first of all, the location of the standards. You know, there's nothing in the state law that says the standards have to be codified or adopted into the general plan or the zoning ordinance. They could exist as a standalone document. There are some pros and cons to that, and I was actually just alerted today um, to reminded that, you know, there could be some issues with how these standards apply in the coastal zone if they're not part of our zoning ordinance. So that's something that we're still kind of working through and thinking about where is the right place for these to live. But we're, we are interested in that conversation and hearing any uh, thoughts from, from the commission. We also are considering making an amendment to the text of the general plan to basically clarify what we're allowed to implement under the state law. So there are two, um, two places in our general plan where we make reference to um, a set of standards as defined by the Planning Commission, and those standards don't exist. Um, and therefore, you know, certain provisions that say, you know, um, you get this much floor area ratio, this many density, this many dwelling units by right, and then if you meet these other certain standards, you can get more floor area ratio and a higher number of, de number of dwelling units per acre. We don't actually have any standards that implement those policies. And um, so we are proposing to just make an amendment to that text section so that it reflects what we're actually able to implement um, in terms of, you know, under the, the changed state law from when the time that the um, general plan was written. Um, thinking about in the context of the state law, moving toward objective standards, how our existing permitting processes might need to change in order to just really reflect and be most effective and productive. We're thinking about um, changing the process so that projects that conform, that meet all of our objective standards, that are not requesting a density bonus, that are not requesting a, any kind of variance or you know, a, a full variance or a minor variation from any of the standards, we're considering changing those so that they're processed administratively without a public hearing. Um, essentially, you know, the way that the state law has changed, it's really, alter the utility and change the way that public hearings can function. So, you know, we still have our community outreach policy in place. So, you know, that would still be in effect and development projects would be required to hold a community meeting to be an opportunity for the community to give feedback to the developer. Um, and we're just thinking about, you know, altering our process so that it really reflects, you know, where, what our ability is in terms of implementing our standards. If something meets the standards, we're pretty much um, obligated to approve it. So we could just handle that administratively and then, um, you know, bring requests for density bonus, requests to vary from standards to your commission or to the city council as necessary. So um, the same would apply for design permit findings. So essentially, you know, the, the design permit findings we have are 
subjective. They were written to be subjective on purpose and be applied on a site by site basis, case by case basis. Um, we're contemplating an amendment to that code section saying if you meet the objective design standards, then you are automatically interpreted to conform to the design permit finding. Another idea that we've had, this has become available recently uh, under state law, is to use the floor area ratio as the density bonus calculation. So um, this would just provide a simpler way of granting a density bonus. So instead of like having a base project and calculating the number of units and then calculating the bonus based on those number of units to be the number of bonus units, we would just look at, um, you know, the, the floor area ratio that's allowed and then grant an additional bonus of additional floor area ratio. So if you're allowed, you know, if the floor area ratio is two and you're allowed a 50% bonus based on, you know, the project proposal, you could get to a floor area ratio of three. And it might just be a little more clear to process applications that way. That's a piece that we're gonna have to do some more analysis about and, um, you know, really do some more thinking. So we'll, if, we, if your commission is interested in this, We'll, we can bring it back for um, further further discussion and further work, but that's something we just kind of wanted to daylight with you all at this point. Um, another thing I did want to bring up is that, as Meredith mentioned, we are you know looking at you know going through all of our existing area plans, looking for places where you know making sure that we've identified all the stuff, all the standards that we do have currently that are objective, so that we're not creating conflict as we adopt these new objective standards. And then also looking at, you know, another thing we realized we can do is kind of make some tweaks to those area plans as sort of like next phase as we roll into 2022 to, to make a couple of changes to those to bring them, you know, more into compliance with needing to be objective standards. Um, and one of the things that we've noticed is that there are, there are a couple of these plans that are really old. So we have the Seabright area plan and we have the um, Western Drive plan that are both um, you know, late 70s, early 80s. And um, we're just, we're kind of wondering, you know, how how worth it is it to be kind of updating those plans and including them in the checklist and how much, you know, work should we do to really dig into them um, versus some of these newer plans that, you know, you know, Ocean Street Area Plan was adopted in like 2014. So if we want to be sure that we're implementing that. That's recent public input and a lot of work went into that. And so, we're just kind of trying to think about like how do we treat these really old area plans that are you know two general plans ago and no longer reflect the needs or um, sensibilities of the community potentially. So we're interested in any feedback your commission might have about that. And then I also just want to mention um, you know we reviewing the 831 Water Project, our first SB35 application, really helped the whole city realize which standards we have that are objective and which standards need further refinement. And there were several standards that came up that are in the, under the purview of public works relating to traffic and roadway standards that um, they are reviewing and working on to kind of bring into conformance with this objective standards requirement. They're working on that on their own. We are supporting them to the extent that we can and ideally, those would come and, you know, get onto a similar timeline when we, when these come back for public hearings, we would be able to, you know, they would take those to their commission, Transportation and Public Works Commission, we would bring our zoning standards here to your commission, and then when we go to the city council, we'd be able to tie these, you know, these two pieces together. So, you know, I'm optimistic that that could happen, and if, if they're not on exactly the same time scale, they, they could follow very shortly after, you know, within the next few months. But um, just wanted to let you know that that is happening on a parallel track. Similarly, we're working also with the Parks Department to um, create standards around street trees. Um, and we're working with them to figure out exactly what's the right place for those standards. I, I think that we've provided them to you. They're part of the packet. And um, I think at this point where, where we're headed is that, you know, the standards requiring that trees be planted and how many and how to calculate how many trees are required, those would be part, come part of the zoning ordinance. And then um, the, the really like specific standards about exactly where and exactly how far from various 
different features on a site, those trees should be planted, those might be more appropriate to be in the parks and rec standard because that gets into more like the how is it done, not like is it done and to what degree, which is more in the zoning code. So we're still working that through with, um, with parks and it's been a really good partnership where I'm excited about that stuff. So the intent is to keep all of these you know, as close together as possible. You know, they also have a Parks and Recreation Commission that they have to take their stuff to. So we're thinking about all of that and collaborating across departments. But some of these do really require some specialized analysis that does not, um, doesn't happen in planning and is not part of the scope of work uh, for our consultant team. So now I'm gonna hand it back to Meredith to talk about our next steps. Our immediate next thing is launching the financial feasibility calculator that Strategic Economics helped us with. This is a great tool that lets you look at different policy levers and the options in the green and the screenshot are things you can change. So number of stories or the mix of units. And then on the far right, you get to see how that impacts the feasibility of a building being built. And um, these are just concepts uh, that are you know, high level trying to think of trade-offs and giving the public more context. And so as a caveat, there are some of these scenarios that go beyond the current allowable FAR. It's not being proposed now, but it's just um, meant to be a learning tool. Um, and the thinking is that this could also be integrated into some of the city's future planning efforts, perhaps with the upcoming housing elements. Uh, this was in your packet, I believe, and will also be available on the project website and our engagement website. And then in terms of more event-based um, next steps, we, as Sarah mentioned, are going to the city council later this month, November 30th. We have the website being launched um, next Monday on November 8th, and it'll be open for four weeks, so through December 6th. During that time, um, we'll have a launch event where we walk the community through some of the context behind this and how to use the website. And then if um, while they are using the online activities, they want to talk to city staff or the consultant team. We have a couple of office hours that are on a drop-in basis where they could ask questions or talk things through for clarification. Um, the financial calculator will be ongoing, available um, to, to the public. Then in mid-November, we're also working on a focus group with developers and architects to get their feedback as the ones who would be implementing this on the development side. And then finally, um, in early 2022, we'll be coming back to you and to the council to um, hear the adoption of the final standard. And with that, I'm gonna open it up to feedback and questions. I'll uh, turn it over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. Um, okay, so at this point, we have gone through so much stuff. This is a very dense packet. Um, I, just, I commend all of you for bringing your thinking brains to the meeting tonight. So, you know, there are some specific areas that we're interested in feedback. Of course, we can answer any questions. We can talk about whatever your commission is interested in talking about. But, um, you know, in terms of handling the permit processing and thinking about these older area plans, and then a couple of areas in the draft standards, thinking about ground floor uses, building articulation, and then transitions to residential neighborhoods, those are kind of areas where we have the most questions for ourselves and are, are interested in your feedback. Um, and so with that, um, I can leave this up on the screen or um, we can just we can just head into our discussion, however the chair would like to handle it. Okay, why don't we, um, we can put this back up if it becomes, uh, you know, when and if it becomes relevant, but Let's uh, go take this. At this point, we'll have questions, just questions from the commission. Then we'll have public input, and then we'll have um, discussion by the commission. Okay, so are there commissioners that have questions? Well, I don't believe I'm going to be the only commissioner with questions. So go ahead, uh, Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, I just wanted, I think this is a, a question about how you're reporting results. Um, so, um, and this is a little bit backwards because you guys have already developed the standards on these, but um, something that stood out to me in looking at how you were presenting results is one of the things is that something like um, a select all 
it is a notoriously weak survey tool. I mean, statistically, and, and, and reporting the just saying in, in several parts of the presentation brought up several times, and it was on the trade off um, for more uh, affordable housing. Saying to the public that the most people selected that is not an accurate reflection of the actual statistical analysis of, of, of a survey tool like that. So I guess I just want to caution us that when we're presenting statistics, I mean, actually, it's not a statistic. You just counted the number of responses. And without a statistical analysis of a survey tool like that, that's not accurately. It, it may be, but I don't know by you just presenting the count. So I just want us to be very careful because when we do surveys, um, we have to extrapolate, and when we say things like most people said that they wanted higher heights, when you do select all, you don't require people to select how much they like something over something else. And, and by not doing that, you really uh, reduce the ability to make any conclusions about things like that. So I just want to caution us all that as we go through processes like this and we do survey outreach, that we're careful about how we present this. Could you, could you explain, so this is a comment that we've got from a couple of members of the public, and I will be honest, I took statistics in grad school, but I am not a statistician. So could you explain how we should explain that? I mean, to me, I look at the pie chart, and I add up the other numbers, and that's, you know, we had this many that are under, we had this many that selected other options. I'd love to get that right. So this particular one that I'm speaking of was presented as a bar chart, and it was just the count for people who said height, people who said something else, people, um, let me just pull it up really quickly so I know what I'm saying. It was something else, uh, fewer parking spaces, less expensive materials. So you just presented a bar chart, and you said that you had eight, uh, what did you say? What was the total number of responses? Eight, 800 and something, right? For the total number of survey responses? That's right, eight, 819. Right, so if you add up those numbers, they don't add up to 819 because people could select all, right? So they, they could, could select, they could select up to three. Okay, but you, you didn't have them rank those. If no. you didn't have them rank those, statistically just providing a count doesn't really tell us what people actually thought. And so if you're gonna use a tool like this, I would, I mean, I'm not a statistician either, but that just really um, stood out to me because it was brought up several times that most of the respondents selected increased building height. And that's not necessarily reflected in the survey unless you statistically analyze this, not just. Okay. So you can Google it. I Google it sure. okay. just to make sure I knew what I was saying. <laughs> okay, sure. All right, that's helpful. Thanks. Well, let me follow up on that question because um, I want to just clarify whether uh, staff consultants think that that survey was a representative sample of the community as a whole. I, I saw it as being indicative uh, myself Looking at the participants, uh, almost half had incomes over 100%, uh, over 100,000, where only 37% of the city population have that, and only 10% had incomes under 25,000, where 24% of the city residents did. So, you know, from my perspective, I thought the results were interesting, um, but it, to my mind, it's not, a, you know, methodologically a representative sample of the uh, of the population as a whole. I, I didn't get the sense that that was how you were presenting it. Um, I see it as a helpful way of um, getting a sense of where different groups are coming from, maybe what um, overall people think about things. But you know, I guess that's my question. Are you? Put, your sense that this survey really was representative? They were all self-selected. Mm -hmm. God knows is in itself a uh, right. very, uh, you know, leads to a very biased sample. Sure. 
Yeah, so, you know, this is a community survey. This is not a scientific survey. You know, we weren't sending out door knockers. We are not the census, <laughs> you know. So um, the idea here was to get what we, would hope, what we were hoping would be a representative sample. There were some gaps, as you've correctly identified. That's why low-income households were one of the focus groups that we held. Uh, we also had a significant gap in terms of young adults um, in, that, in those demographic data, and so we were sure to have um, a focus group talking to those. So we're, what we're looking here for here is like representative sample of voices, and some of those were achieved through focus groups, and some of those, you know, we kind of pulled through the survey. Together, it gives us information. We're, you know, we have drafted standards, and we really want to be collaborative with the community about those standards at this point. You know, that's the whole, this whole next engagement. We have, you know, four weeks because it's a lot of content. Um, right. Really I, I guess I, my concern is using the word representative has a sort of a methodological implication. I think what you, from what I understood from looking at the survey, you had a range of views. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, using those views uh, as a basis for some of the standards, um, if it, may, if it also made sense from the consultants and the staff's point of view as a good first step, but at the end, um, it needs, they need, they may need refinements, some may be better than others. Um, I think, uh, I don't think, I guess what I'm saying, I don't think it can be argued that this, that these standards are what the community said that they wanted. This mm -hmm. is, these are standards that resulted from a process where there was significant com community input Mm -hmm. uh, that was helpful in developing these draft standards. And, um, you know, I, I want to thank the consultants and thank staff for all the work that went into this because there was a lot of work. And, I th and you know, I, I felt positive about a lot of it. So, I, you know, I don't, I'm, this isn't meant as a criticism. I'm just trying to put the, you know, the focus groups and, uh, um, and uh, the survey into a, Sort of a broader context sure. uh, that these aren't the end all be all these are helpful right yeah no we didn't take these individual standards and like try to go out and make sure we heard from a, an exactly representative segment of the population i you know that's not that wasn't the goal that wasn't what we were trying to accomplish um and i do think you know i do just want to reiterate the city hasn't typically collected demographic data on community engagement events this is we are just starting to do that now. You know, we did it in this project. It's happening in the climate action survey, the action plan update that's happening currently. Um, and this is going to become one of our standard practices to improve our outreach and, in, in, and ensure that we are getting more and more representative of, you know, actual, our actual demographics. So, at least you know, knowing I, I how do believe. It is. What's that? Or at least knowing how representative it is. So I right, think yeah, that so that we have some we have some context for who's giving us feedback. And you know, to our understanding, this is you know a more diverse range of respondents than we've had previously. We also you know, did. Okay, right. I don't want to belabor the point. I do have a couple of uh, uh, comments or one question on the community survey, and I'm going to go through my questions through the attachments because I didn't read the staff report until yesterday when it came out. So uh, I normally would stop my questions on the staff report, but I'm going to be ending with the staff report. Um, but this is, a, this is just my own ignorance. The survey talks about capital BIPOC as a, a group. Who is that referring to? I couldn't put the acronym together. Sure, that's an acronym that stands for Black, Indigenous, People of Color. Uh, okay, so it's not white. Right, our non-white, non non-Asian population. Okay, let me also say I had a, and even I have a pretty good sized monitor. Uh, even when I um, looked at the PDF on my full screen, I had a really hard time differentiating between the different colors. Um, okay. I would say the legend, the colors in the legend, they, they, the boxes should be bigger. Um, and okay. the difference between the purple and the blue, and, and they were so small that I really had a hard time looking at them. So just a suggestion that those be, um, those be, you know, 
increased uh, as you go out to the public to sort of show the results of the, of the survey so that more people can really evaluate it as it happens and not depend on the survey person. Then I had some questions about the MU district draft standards. That whole discussion seems to me to be um, delusional because nobody's using those. In every case, what we're seeing now over and over again is people using density bonuses. And density bonuses to go from three stories to six stories, as we just saw in Center Street, uh, the project downtown going from whatever the requirement was to a high. So how meaningful are these? I'm sort of reluctant to, I mean, they're already, we've already dug the hole in terms of the general plan. Um, and so this probably doesn't make it any worse. But I, I do think it's important to recognize that the density bonus law really undermines um, all the, at least that's my view of it, maybe you would disagree with me, but um, to, to sort of put too much, to sort of say this is the way that, to give a sense that this is the way this, the projects are going to come through is certainly not reflecting recent reality. That was the problem I had with the test fits, and that's the problem I have with the, with the standards, is that they're not very meaningful anymore because the density bonus, uh, particularly when we don't have any density limits, really, uh, the, one of the recommendations is that the city start using FAR, FARs. That's what, the, that's what the state has been using in the recent projects because there are no density limits for the studios and one bedrooms, there are no density limits for SROs. So the only uh, limit is the FAR. And so I'm not sure that's gonna really represent much of a change um, given the, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the way things are, are going and what the law allows. So am I, am I, am I, am I misunderstanding something here? Well, I wouldn't say that you're misunderstanding it. And I would say um, there, there are a couple of factors at play. I think, you know, one of the one thing is that seeing a bunch of density bonus applications is an indication to me that something in our standards or our process doesn't facilitate development. And so people pursue a density bonus in order to have a feasible development. So in theory, creating standards that actually do work and create feasible development, allow feasible development to happen, shifts those incentives to some extent. And the other thing I wanna say is that this is where, um, you know, we're looking for how can we incentivize conforming development? And one of, the, one of the tools that we have is faster processing time. So if that's hence our recommendation to move conforming processes, conforming projects to an administrative process. So they don't pay a fee for a public hearing. They don't have the delay of a public hearing. They go through an administrative process with staff if they're conforming and meeting all the standards. And that changes the, the decision-making for a developer as well. If a density bonus always has to go to a public hearing and a conforming project does not, and it still has to provide the inclusionary standard um, and not request any waivers, concessions, or incentives, um, I think that does start to change that calculus. For developers, I just wanted to add, Sarah, if I can. Um, the last time that we presented to you, we showed you a number of test fits on different sites, and we also did an economic analysis. And this was a while back, but um, it turned out that actually none of the projects were feasible within the existing uh, height limits and FAR. So I think that really underlined Sarah's point about projects just aren't feasible at the moment unless they use density bonus. That's definitely consistent with our findings. Yeah, I mean, and that's current market conditions, right? So that's current construction costs, that's current rents and for sale prices. So yes, all of that can shift and does. Um, and, you know, we're trying to think about like, how can we incentivize conforming development? And, you know, one of the biggest incentives we have is timeliness. So that's our suggestion. It's, and I will acknowledge this is a legitimate concern. The density bonus changes a lot. You know, density bonus projects can do a lot of things that conforming development can't. Um, and, you know, that state law comes out of the same ethos of 
creating more housing units is part of addressing the housing shortage. So I understand that's not um, necessarily a value that's shared universally, and that is the you know state law perspective that we are operating within. Related to the um, financial account, I don't want to. This is a time for questions, so I really don't want to engage in a, a debate about uh, what's right for the city. But um, there was a slide that gave the address for the link for the um, financial calculator, which I thought was very useful. Um, I would appreciate it. I, I didn't. I wasn't able to write it down fast enough. I have a terrible time going through the city's website. I never can find anything. Uh, I always get deep into it, and I would find out I'm on the wrong page. So if it would be possible to send out that link, I'd really appreciate it. And then I have some uh, specific questions about attachment nine, which is a street, uh, street tree standard. The standard uh, was, would require a two-year maintenance agreement. My understanding from projects, at least in the county, maybe in the city as well, is that they have started to really require five-year maintenance agreements because two years really isn't enough hmm, okay. for new vegetation to take hold. So I would, uh, I just ask what was the, I guess my question is what's the basis of that uh, two year um, uh, Just m my understanding that that was our current practice, but if we're moving to five year, you know, that's an easy swap. swap. Yeah. Maybe you're not and the county is, and I'm just aware of what the county's doing, but I know that, um, okay. you know, uh, people in the field have just argued that two years just isn't enough time for vegetation to take hold. And actually, uh, some of the standards go beyond five years, but they also include the requirement of replacement should the, um, should the, should the vegetation die. Uh, and I think that that's an important standard as well. That's not, just not that they have to maintain it for five years, but if they kick the bucket uh, as it was, they'd be replaced. So I'd ask for that, you know, I think it's within that as well. And then I wondered the 30-foot frontage for street trees. I thought it was a good objective standard, but but I wondered what is the spacing of the trees on the mall uh, on Pacific Avenue on the mall? Uh, is, the, uh, is there 30 feet? Because that seems like a good. Uh, you know, I know there was a lot of debate about the kinds of trees and the spacing of trees, and uh, people seem satisfied with that. So I just wonder how does it relate to uh, what the standards are on the mall, on the mall. I don't know the answer to that. Um, so and I, I, will, just, I can look, we can look that up. I just want to add one thing uh, to that because the, the standards, the way the standards is written is that it's one tree for every 30 feet of frontage. They don't necessarily have to be placed every 30 feet. Right, um, we wanted to allow that to be, okay, as long as it's great. Okay, yeah, we can, I can look into that and um, yeah, consider how, you know, how that relates. <laughs> then on the uh, attachment A, the standards themselves, on page three, as I understood it, it was saying that the standards would apply outside of the downtown for multi-density development. Um, why don't they apply downtown as well? Um, mostly because the downtown plan is, all, is already really specific in terms of design standards and has some of the, the only really existing objective design standards in the city. Also, the downtown has really different density limits than anywhere else in the city. Like, scale of, yeah, it's just a really different scale. Okay, it just seemed while um, there was talk about all the other area plans, how it all related to that, you know, there was the only exception seemed to be the downtown, downtown okay. plan. So maybe if that was explained, it would be helpful. Um, I have problems, and I, I would imagine the architects on the commission won't, uh, doesn't, I'm not sure much needs to be done about it, um, but I had problems understanding uh, how the, par the parking screening uh, standards would work, um, and as well as how the roof form standards would work and the part of frontage. It will be helpful to have some examples of those. Some of the standards do show examples of how they would operate. I think those are areas for non-architects, at least, uh, I would think. I 
wouldn't be the only one who would benefit from being able to, to, to understand that. And then um, a, a question I have has to do with um, the how or to, I, the, on the building design. Um, the it was interesting that in the survey results, it seemed like there was a strong um, emphasis on the need for private open space. But as I saw the, what was written in on page nine, the usable open space, it was possible to uh, substitute common open space for uh, private open space on a two to one basis, uh, which seems to me would could eliminate any private open space, which in the end seemed to contradict what the uh, survey had found. So am I understanding that correctly? Would that uh, common open space substitution essentially allow for the total elimination of private open space? Can you want to jump in? Yeah, we have stated a preference for private open space. Um, it, uh, it would allow the total elimination of it. Um, Yes, it would. Well, I think that's problematic, especially given how strongly people seem to want it, mm -hmm. uh, want the private open space. So it may be worth giving that another look, maybe to an extent, community open space. Um, I don't know why. I don't know if any of you are following what's going on with UC Santa Barbara, where this very wealthy person wants to uh, oh my gosh. fund yeah. 11 story building with no windows and have all public open, all common open space and no private open space. Uh, and it seems more like a prison than anything else. So um, I would, you know, I, that did seem like a contradiction. I just wanted to ask you to consider it. In terms of the upper level paper, I thought that was uh, an interesting approach, but I wonder why you chose 15% as opposed to 20%. Uh, what was uh, having the upper stories set back seemed like a really good um, standard, but I don't know how you came up if there was any particular uh, logic to the 15%. We tested it out on our test fit sites, and 15 seemed to. I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, we tested it out on our test fit sites, um, and 15% seemed to get us. Uh, kind of a, a feasible reduction um, in area. Once we got up to 20%, it was, or higher, it was starting to be too much of a reduction in area, uh, particularly on those kind of really large sites where especially, if, I don't know if you recall, we looked at one of the uh, kind of a courtyard style building. As you start to get a bigger percentage reduction, when you have a courtyard in the middle, it becomes very infeasible to have those kind of smaller uh, dimensions on the upper floors. So we're okay. again trying to always balance between feasibility while also achieving the kind of desires of the community surrounding those setbacks. And then uh, my final question, I guess, is uh, or the difficulty I had was on page 13, the building uh, modulation which requires articulation of building frontages where building, a building is over 30 feet. Again, I think it would be really helpful to see some examples of that um, to really understand what that means. Um, let me just say that the, you know, where one of the examples where there was a, uh, a good drawing that showed um, how the standard would work, which was requiring that there'd be no parking allowed in the frontage um, between the, the frontage of a building and the property line, uh, immediately um, made me think of a project I'm very aware of where that would make it infeasible, the project infeasible because the design sets the building way back, but has, so it has a lot of open space in front, but then has a driveway coming in with parking along the driveway. Um, Sort of angle parking or, or, you know, sort of inward parking, and none of those spaces would be allowed, which would make it impossible to meet the parking requirement. 
So, you know, I was thinking, okay, well, thank you, bonus waiver, here we come. So I, I, I think that um, I, I, I re recognize that it's really difficult to have to come up with these standards in many areas. And I appreciate the work that's been done. Uh, I was, um, I thought, I was, thought many of them really made sense. And, um, and we're, you know, we're trying to go beyond simply increasing the capacity of housing um, and the production of housing, but also being concerned about what is this going to look like? What is this going to do to the uh, area around it? What, is it what are the kinds of concerns that it's, that it's, go it's going to raise um, in terms of having a city that um, has some standards and just doesn't reach for the lowest common denominator? So again, that was, I hope I tried to keep my uh, comments here as mostly questions. Uh, I will definitely have comments once uh, other commissioners ask their questions and the public has a chance to see their answers. So thank you for, again, for the staff report and the work. Commissioner Nielsen. And then uh, Commissioner well, Spellman. This is the question period. Uh, at least we can try. I, I, have, I have some questions. But first, before I even ask my questions, I want to thank staff and uh, the consultants for doing such a great job. This is. Um, there's a lot of information here. You guys have done a great job in, in the presentation tonight. Um, and it was a lot for us to get through um, over the last week too. So, <laughs> so thank you for putting in the time. Um, uh, I, I wanna start with, I'll, I'll, I'm, my questions are really around the, the um, objective standards. And the first one is page five. Um, that, and I'm curious about the, the stack flat versus the townhome and what the, what the reasoning is there um, for the 50% the, the parking reduction. Um, I'll actually, Kristen, can I start? <laughs> and then Did you say this is page five? Page five, yeah, this is page five of the standard. And it's okay. Yeah. I said the walkability. Uh, oh no, no, sorry. it's under uh, gold. I see. It's maximum. We're we're looking at maximum building length right now, part A. Yeah. So, um, one of the things that we learned through doing this process and doing the test fits is that um, you know when we looked at our RL sites, so our low density multifamily sites. Um, it was really pretty difficult to come up with a product on those sites that met all of our development standards and still hit a price point that we felt like could be rental housing. And that was something that we were interested in trying to achieve. And it was something that, you know, as, as I mentioned, at least 51% of the population was interested in trying to have us achieve. And one of the ways that we have learned you can do that is by pursuing sort of what are called missing middle housing types. And one of the things that, um, one of those types is specifically a stacked flat. So it's a fourplex or it's a sixplex where the, where the flats are stacked on top of one another. In order to do a development type like that, you need the right dimensions on a lot so that the, so that the um, dimensions of each unit kind of make sense relative to each other. So if, um, it works best in places where there are alleyways. Santa Cruz doesn't have alleyways. And so um, one of the things that we were trying to achieve was to allow this building type to happen because um, that type of building, the units tend to be a little bit smaller. You know, if you think about our, our current standards in the RL, we allow two and a half or three stories of structure. And so if you have a, you know, a townhouse that's built on that, where you have the parking that's within the building envelope, so the, you, know, mm -hmm. you park on the ground floor and you have stacked above that, you know, those units can be 2,000 square feet, like pretty easily. And then they're essentially the cost of a single family home. And so you're not really getting any economy in terms of, you know, what's available in the marketplace. So we wanted to pursue this different building type and really encourage something that was like a traditional style fourplex, sixplex with stacked flats where the units tend to be a little bit smaller. If they're sold, they're sold as condos instead of townhomes. And you get, you can hit a, a lower price point and it can, 
conceivably come in for rental housing. And thinking about how to do that and how to balance all of these different things, it really came down to how much parking is required. And so then we went to this incentive of like, well, let's reduce the parking by half. And then, you know, we have to fit less parking on the site. And so that can work better with the dimensions and the, the um, configurations of parcels that we have in Santa Cruz. Anything to add, Kristen? Um, um, and and uh, in a way, basically, what what it what you are trying to accomplish, it sounds like, is hitting that well, uh, hitting the rental housing market. Doing what you know what we can, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. And by kind of taking this parking out of the building, you don't you kind of run out of space on the site on the lot if you try to surface park it. Um, so by cutting it in half, we allow them to take the parking out of the building, which means they're not building housing for cars. They just have to build housing for people, which really reduces the cost of construction. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the cost to, to build housing for cars is very expensive. <laughs> um, let's see. The, uh, on the same page, uh, this is now down in the walkability section, uh, and it's section three. Um, subsection I, um, it's talking about the block where, where, where you have block lengths that, are, that exceed 500 feet. Uh, and then creating, if a project is mid-block, let's say, or 50% of the block, 50, or the, I, I don't know exactly how the wording goes, but basically is, is the connections are created there. Now, um, my question here. I, mean, I think it's a great idea, but I think, but my question is if a connection is already there or somewhere within that mid block area, mm -hmm. you're not requiring another development to, to add that and add in another connection. Cause it's just the way it's written doesn't, doesn't make it super clear. It almost makes it look like if you're in the mid 50%, then, and you're developing a project, you have to put in this connection. So, um, so somehow, just um, if that's not the intent, then then I think just taking a look at that would be would be a good idea. Um, it, it's, it's still in the same um, section, but this is uh, section four of the walkability piece. Um, is this is this saying that property? So this is properties that are adjacent to parcels developed with a public way shall include connection to that public way. Is that, does that mean that these parcels that are adjacent to the parcels that have the, the, the connection also are adjacent to the connection itself? Not, I just, I don't quite, I'm, maybe I'm just not understanding exactly what, what's being said here or, or kind of what, what the goal is with that one. Yeah. So um, I can try to answer this because I, I think we kind of foisted this standard on the consultants from the city side. So what we're trying to get at is um, if there is a path, if there is a roadway, if there is any kind of pedestrian easement or vehicle travel path that is adjacent to your parcel, as new development goes in, we want to make that permeable. And we so there are standards in there about like if there are any existing crossings on the site you have to maintain you can't you know reduce the number of crossings that are on a site so, and I was thinking about you know um, like for example at the site where um, where Ross and World Market are you know the there are two bike lanes and and a pedestrian mm -hmm. path that cross that site to connect to the levee trail mm -hmm. and so you know. 50 years from now in a different general plan or something, if, if that were to redevelop in any kind of significant way, we would still want to see two paths cross that parcel. Mm -hmm. um, and so additionally, any other paths that are, you know, any other parcels that are adjacent to that levee trail, if they're redeveloping, we want them to be connecting to that levee trail. If they're adjacent right. to a roadway, we want them to be creating a connection to that um, levee trail. Um, you know, one of the things that we want to keep in mind is that, you know, we may have like one side of a block developed before the other side of the block. So in, we may, the standard could in some cases sort of create a dead end or a path to nowhere. And we would still kind of want to create the path so that we preserve to that opportunity. And then as adjacent development happens, it can connect to that path. And we are trying to find a way to say that. And I, you know, won't just, 
we probably haven't hit the most elegant way of articulating that yet. So, you know, I, we are, we are refining, we are open to comments and suggestions on that, but that's the intention. Well, well, to, to Chair Shiprin's point, I am an architect and, and I do, and even I had difficulties with reading through some of these standards as well. And, and it's, um, there's a lot of meat to them and, but, but having it, some sort of, uh, diagram helps greatly with things like that. Um, so whatever, you know, that, that would be helpful, I think, in terms of, um, you know, help if you're having, if, if there's difficulty in kind of creating language to make it clear, you know, diagrams are obviously, uh, really helpful. Um, the next question I have is, then is under public frontages and, um, this is uh, section four of public frontages, and it, this is talking about entries into primarily oh, resident. Uh, this is page six, yes. Uh, this is primarily, this is ent entrances into, primar in, uh, into primarily residential districts. So entrances into the building, I think is what we're dealing with. And it's saying um, ground floor units that face a public frontage shall provide an entry facing toward the public frontage that provides access into an entry area, living area, kitchen, or hallway, not a bedroom or a bathroom, um, which is great. I think that makes sense. Um, but how, how, do, how do you handle studios in this, in this situation? Just because studios don't really have a designated bedroom. It's a good point. Um, maybe we need to clarify that doesn't apply to studios. I think that's a good point. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then the next, the next question. This is this is actually going to the the. Um, the, uh, the diagram about the parking in front of the building. So this is, sorry, this is page seven. Um, this is parking location and screening. Um, and Commissioner Schifrin, um kind of pointed to this, um, th this one already. But my question on this is if, if, if we're not gonna allow parking in that, in front of the building, and I don't know exactly what the what the setbacks, what the front setbacks are in, in all of these areas. So, um, is there a way if we don't allow parking there? Is there can we can we get some reduced setback there so we can push that building forward to allow for that parking to maybe be in behind? Um, because I think that's the goal here is that we're we're trying to get to parking in the in the behind you know off the you know away from the the, the street. Um, so anyway, it's just something to look at. Uh, on that. Um, let's see, I only have a, like maybe one or two more here, I think. Oh, yeah, I think I just have one more. I have a question. On, uh, this is on, sorry, this is on page 19. This is the building material section. Um, it specifically calls out um, panelized materials such as cement board, cement board panels and metal panels. I'm curious what, it, 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 sorry, it calls these out as being prohibited uh, as materials used on the frontage. So I'm curious what the thoughts are around the, uh, why, why not using, or why not allowing these materials? Most of these um, design standards are sort of 360, so they go all around the building. This is one of the few that only applies to the front of the building. Um, and the idea there is that these, I mean, we know that those kind of panelized materials tend to be more affordable, but they also um, tend to wear, show wear uh, much more quickly in terms of deterioration, and especially when you see them coming together and they start to slip or the kind of the drip lines that you see the staining, they tend to be much more common on these types of panelized materials. So it was a way to kind of speak to the community's desire for higher quality materials. And we've only put, we've only had this 
restriction on public frontages because you can use them on the other frontages as a way to kind of save costs, but we want those frontages that to be some of the highest quality materials. Um, okay, I understand. I understand that. I, I think the um, one one thing I would just as a comment and, and to caution about is um, maybe there's a different way to um, to qualify what material what materials are not um, appropriate we, we've I mean I've seen cement cement panels that are that are thicker like if, you, if you're speaking directly to like you know hardy board or, or something like that then then that's that's one thing but there are other products that that have a, that have a, a much thicker reveal to them or that are produced in a thicker fashion um, but they are cement fiber. I mean, that's just that's what they're made out of, which you know is a is is, is a um, it's a durable material, and uh, and there are ways to make and they and they do look nice. I mean, th there are options for that. So I just would be careful about just like maybe getting maybe it needs to be a little bit more specific, like in terms of maybe what the thickness of the material is and and what you don't use um, or what's not allowed. Um, because that, to me, that that particular material, I, I think is, is, I think is, could be fine used in the right way, um, and maybe. But but I agree with you about like if we're talking about hardy panel. I mean, there's it's it's you know the thickness and it creates waves and you know it, and it has it does have issues. So um, I, that was just that was kind of more of a comment, I guess. Feedback. Um, that was it. That's all my. Question. Thank you. Commissioner, thank you. Commissioner Spellman, uh, your question? Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, I'm going to hold my comments until later. I really just have one question, and it's a little bit broader. It's I think it's relating to designation of live work as being the only residential use. I think it's in the mixed use zone district. Is that right? Are we saying we don't want any residential under any circumstances on the ground floor? So, yes, to a certain degree. <laughs> so in those areas that are designated in the general plan for mixed use, those are our like outside of the downtown, those are our core commercial areas. And so in those areas, we are currently considering and you know proposing that we not allow fully residential buildings that at least that frontage of the building that has to be a full legitimate commercial active use um other areas that are zoned for commercial development so places that are in the beach area other places that are zoned cc sort of like further out on socal and like you know in other areas along mission currently you can do residential only projects there. And we want to continue to allow that. And based on this feedback and interest in active uses, one of the things that we're proposing is that those ground floor uses, when they face a major street like that, that they incorporate or they have the ability to incorporate a commercial use. So they're built to that dimension. They have the floor plate height to accommodate that. Um, and, you know, those are for the units that face the street. We can still do like regular res residential units if they face the rear of the property. So there's still sort of opportunities for accommodating, um, you know, any accessible units that might be, you know, required to incorporate into a project. But um, this is really about creating that like activated commercial frontage, um, even if it's a fully residential building. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. That makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. Other commissioners that would have questions at this time, Commissioner Conway. Yeah, thank you. I look forward to talking more about this after we hear public comment. Um, but one question I had was on um, public works and on the roadway analysis. I know you referred to it a little bit, but um, is there an opportunity for the more comprehensive kind of, um, uh, you know, considering what our roadways are, where, how we want to use their interaction with our um, you know, each block of development. Um, it sounded like it's kind of a, uh, 
it's a little hard to fit it in. And I know that that in the past we really wanted to do a more comprehensive um, discussion about that. I'm not sure I understand your question. You're talking about like making plan lines. Well, not no, not down to that detail necessarily, but um, the uh, the comment that uh, you know the where was it? It was um, traffic and roadway standards that um, we're definitely going to um, try to develop some objective standards because we need them, mm -hmm. and I think we've known that we need them for a while. So it sounds like Public Works is is um, working really hard to come along with this, and I was just wondering if there's a more if there is any opportunity for a more comprehensive consideration of traffic and roadway standards, or are we going to be doing them just following right along each of these um, development standards? Because they play a big role. Sure. Yeah. So let me see if I can I can try to answer that. So. Um, you know, at this point, we don't have anything in our work plan that would be taking this more like comprehensive look at like how do we use our public realm, what's in within the right of way. Um, what we're talking about is public works sort of um, stopping some leaks in their current standards as they, you know, discover that a lot of them really are written to it um, involved a lot of professional judgment by the city engineer and the director of public works, um, and that that really doesn't work under this new framework. So it's it's really more focused on just sort of trying to capture what the standards that they already have. It's not at this point they're not looking at you know creating any kind of new standards that we don't already have some basis for. So places where we have policies or standards that are like written, you know, it's that to the to the approval of the city engineer, such and such a you know thing shall be performed. Like they need to rewrite that so that it's an actual measurable performance standard. So it's more like that level that they're working on. We also, I'll just add, we also um, have a minimum setback, a minimum sidewalk step along the corridors, so that any new buildings that come along will at least achieve a minimum sidewalk point through. In, in terms of the setback. And then also, as Sarah mentioned, the kind of street tree stuff. The problem is, or the challenge is, that um, these are standards for private property. And actually, as we were going through the area plans, you guys have a lot of great thinking about public realm for all of, especially for all of these different corridors and gateways and landscaping. It's just that there's no way to implement that through private development right now. So, um, we did. That was a. That was something that we talked about too. It's just that it feels like there's an opportunity to kind of build on these plans, but this this piece of work didn't feel like the place to do that. Okay. Thank you. Other com uh, commissioner questions before I open it up to the public. Okay. Um, I see two hands up. Uh, three hands up. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, Rafa Sonnenfeld. You have uh, three minutes. Um, yes. Go ahead. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Um, you know, first, uh, I wanted to appreciate all the hard work that's gone into this, especially the efforts to do the in community engagement to bring in underrepresented groups. I, I think that's really important for us in our community. Um, you know, Santa Cruz is an exclusionary community. Um, we have 60% of our households that are more than 200% above the poverty level, and uh, we're white, whiter than our region as a whole. We're 60% white, and our region is only 40% white. So I think if we want to have equity, we need to have more representation and maybe, dare I say, over-representation from minority groups um, when we do these sorts of, of analysis. So we really have are, are, are meeting the needs of, of you know, the future of, 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 of our community. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to bring up is, um, you know, following state law, uh, especially SB 330, like was mentioned earlier, you know, it's really important that we uh, not reduce the intensity of, of land use development. Um, and, and I appreciate that, that we are really thinking carefully about how these objective standards may uh, constitute a, a down zoning and how we can um, you know, balance 
uh, uh, reductions in height or, or increased setbacks with increases in height, et cetera. Um, so, you know, uh, the Attorney General's office just announced yesterday that there's a new housing accountability, uh, housing strike force. HCD has a new housing accountability unit. So, we, you know, we really need to get this right in terms of following the law. But I just wanted to uh, highlight a couple things that, that I'm looking at, you know, from that lens of, of following the law. I just want to make sure that, you know, as we move forward that, that uh, uh, we do so legally. And that's, you know, things like the, um, the, the uh, open space requirement, um, the, uh, uh, the height limits, uh, the setbacks, um, the upper taper goal, um, you know, all of those things, you know, in, in a vacuum, they sound like, you know, good sort of design things, but if they, you know, are reducing the intensity of land use and, and uh, you know, the square footage that's possible on, on, a, on a parcel, that's technically illegal uh, unless we have a commensurate up zoning somewhere else through our general plan or through zoning changes. So, you know, we really need to be intentional about how, uh, uh, you know, if, if we are put, putting limits and, you know, we have certain zones now that have no limits on density, I don't see how we can have any sort of objective standard that reduces that density for, you know, a, a, a studio or a one bedroom or an S SRO if, if they're currently allowed under the law um, and we're putting objective standards that limit that building envelope, I don't see how that's a legal enforceable thing that we're doing. So, you know, I, I think uh, finally, I just wanted to mention, um, I think we're moving in the right direction, thinking about ministerial approval for uh, zoning conforming projects. I think that should also apply to density bonus projects. Um, you know, they are Housing Accountability Act conforming um, the city is legally required to approve them anyway. Um, you know, just a couple weeks ago, uh, uh, this commission uh, approved 130 Center Street uh, unanimous, unanimously with the extra affordable units on the condition that it not be appealed. Well, NIMBYs are appealing it, and we're losing four affordable units because of that. If this was a ministerial uh, process, yeah, sure, maybe there wouldn't have been that, that uh, negotiation that you had to get the extra affordable unit. But, you know, this would be a process that would happen much more quickly and, and there would be less risk and we would have more, um, uh, more uh, opportunities for, for developers to, uh, to bring housing into, into our community that we need. Um, so I, I also just wanted to appreciate the fina financial feasibility calculator. I think that's a really important um, tool that, that, that's good for the public to understand. Um, I think that's all my comments. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Kyle Kelly, you have three minutes. Um, is the clerk keeping track of the time? I'll wait for the question to be answered before I speak. Yes, you're not able to hear the timer. The timer went off. Did you not hear it? No. no. Okay, then I'll just butt in when it's your time. <laughs> and then you can decide you. if they... Okay, Mr. Kelly, go ahead. Great. Uh, good evening. Thank, thank you, Chair Shepherd and members of the commission uh, and city staff. It was really great to hear the overall presentation, uh, the outreach to different groups. Um, so oh, I didn't say introduce myself. Well, I guess it happened. I'm, I'm Kyle Kelly. Uh, not too long ago, I was an applied mathematician uh, before transitioning to building tools for other scientists to perform data analysis. Um, earlier, there were questions about the survey data and the methodology. Um, I think when presented in context of how the survey was done, personally, I think this was fine, especially as when it's kind of get, you know, basically some, some basic sampling. Uh, the important thing to do is probably to release the data. Um, but I think at the end of the day, it's worth analyzing that maybe some people just didn't like the results, that some people thought taller buildings would be okay, and then it would result in more housing. And, and I especially want to point out that Affordable housing also has some quality objective standards. These and other zoning restrictions are the reason that 415 Natural Bridges, a 100% SRO project by the Housing Authority that lies right on the rail and trail, where rail would possibly be, has only 20 units and at only three stories. When we have a severe need, like any, any choices that are made about housing, like these homelessness is a policy choice. 
high rent or a, or a policy choice. 20,000 people commuting into Santa Cruz, that's a policy choice. You all have the power to correct the wrongs of the past. And I, I point this out because time and time again, when we go to commissions and city council meetings, we get to hear from homeowners that have lived here a long time and have collected the gains for a year, some of which you yourself are homeowners. And I want you to reflect on how much your home value has gone up and, and how much people need housing right now. So get these objective standards going, find ways to produce more housing, not less, because I know what's about to happen. And what will happen next is it'll be a very tight window on, oh, what do we want? How do we want this to look? Bring it forward, make something better. It's gonna affect affordable housing too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jillian Greenside. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, can I start again? Thank you. You're starting now. Thank you very much. And thank you staff and consultants. That was a very clear presentation. I really appreciated all the detail. Um, I guess if you didn't know the context, uh, you might think that this was an occasion of designing a new town. Uh, and in a way, that's what's happening here. And I, a couple of things I'd like to point out. One, I've really appreciated the outreach to Spanish-speaking members of our community. And I thought it very significant that the Spanish-speaking community were twice as likely to prefer the lower height of four stories than the alternatives, twice as likely as white residents. And I think that shouldn't be glossed over. And I think since our Spanish speaking residents largely live in dense and taller housing um, uh, supply, that maybe that should be looked at further. Maybe there are reasons for that. I also think that you need to acknowledge the density ban. When you talked about um, this corridor, five um, stories high, and this corridor, four stories, people will buy or, or believe that that is the height. And with a density bonus, uh, it would, could be double that. And if you don't want people really um, up in arms at the other end of all of this process, I think somewhere, in your charts, in your speaking, in your presentation, you have to acknowledge that those heights could be subject to a dramatic increase up to double. And I, I can't uh, accept that if it's a ministerial and if there's not a lot of um, um, issues going forward, that developers will be happy to stick with that height. If you can get a density bonus and supply just the amount of affordable housing that we, you would supply at the base density, why wouldn't you want to go higher with market rate housing, which we know puts affordable housing further out of reach of low income people because it raises the area median income. I think also the comment where people in the survey uh, took a height as a trade off for affordable housing, there needs to be a little bit more honesty in this. Uh, we don't always get affordable housing with increased height. So I think, I hope people aren't being misled with some of these questions. And lastly, I don't know where my time is. And to me, this is pretty important. Save Our Big Trees, which is a community group to try and preserve our heritage trees, submitted a detailed proposal for objective standards. Most of our heritage trees are in people's private areas. If you're going to knock down single family homes and small businesses and go up to the height, you will go, could I just, I just finish my sentence. You're going to lose your heritage trees and we put in detailed objective standards and they appear nowhere. Not good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Vera uh, Filippini, please. You have three minutes. Hi, um, thank you, Vera Filippini. First, I want to acknowledge that we are all on Awaswas territory, tribal land, now called Santa Cruz. 
I want to thank Sarah for all the hard work that she and the planning staff have, have put into this first draft of our objective standards. The draft has some great credit, community use, and public access or walkability components that reflect the community survey. However, they are primarily focused on converting our subjective standards around community character to objective standards. What is much more important is that we adopt objective standards that protect public health and public safety. As an example, both earthquake and shade concerns were brought up by a number of people in the focus groups and are not reflected anywhere in the draft standard, but you can read them in the subject material. Also, the survey and focus group questions were very leading in how they were constructed and imply quite directly that there will be more affordable housing if A, B, or C are traded for that affordability. Let's be honest, we know this is misleading. We know that the state density bonus law allows for up to 50% increase in density and that all of those density bonus units can be market rate. This is not increasing but decreasing our affordable housing allocation and raising our AMI. And waivers to things like height regulations and other objective standards are then given to developments along with those density bonus market rate units. Overall, though I'd like to see more amendments to the current draft standards and the categories that were included, the aesthetic elements provided a starting framework for converting community character type standards to objective standards. But what is of utmost importance is that objective standards are drafted and adopted to protect the health and safety of both the current community and the new residents that need housing in these significant developments. This will help smooth the development process, hopefully for affordable housing, and limit the community concern and potential opposition going forward. Please, let's remember health in all policies as we develop these standards that dictate our future here in Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. I see one more hand up. If anybody else wants to speak, uh, please raise your hand. This is 831-426-3857. You're up. Um, Hello. Go ahead. Please, uh, please introduce yourself and you have three minutes. Hello, this is Alan Spidel, and I will not take my three minutes. I just have a question, really, for the staff, um, and that is, has any thought been given to the neighborhoods adjacent to Mission Street and Soquel Street as far as making these residential neighborhoods more like into transition zones uh, so you don't have two-story houses next to five, six, or seven-story buildings? That's a simple question, and just want, just want to know where that is, stands as far as the work that's been done so far. And thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Um, I'll ask Steph to respond, but let's hear the what is. Okay, I guess um, there's another person on the line, 818-203-4965. Go ahead. Just muted, your, just muted yourself, I think. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Please introduce yourself and your opinion. Yes, uh, my name is Candace Brown, and um, I find this uh, a fascinating discussion because we really come full circle to where we were with the quarter plan which was originally proposing um, a mixed use with five stories, but it didn't have the density bonus. Um, this particular scenario, and they were looking at transportation issues, uh, which were of great concern, and the impact of the commercial zone. In this case, they are just focused on the housing, not on the transportation, not on the traffic issues, not on whether we're gonna solve the commute issues for people coming into town, we're also not looking at the large student population. We had no focus group for the uh, commercial people along there. I might add that the last corridor plan, there was a petition of 300 business owners who signed against the corridor plan, and now we're dealing with a plan that's even more impactful. When the original corridor plan was discussed, Joe Eppenrod, who is a commercial broker, talked about the fact that if you reduce the parking, which was at that time just one parking space per unit, you would be dealing with commercial dead zones. This area is a neighborhood community area for the east side or the midtown area. Um, if you're going to reduce the commercial areas, 
then you're looking at an unsustainable environment. You're reducing the reasons for walkability. Um, you're also not even considering the safety issues for protected bike lanes and for um, pedestrians, you know, purpose for going to those areas in the first place. There is a need for housing. We all agree. Um, show me where this can bring more affordable housing and I'll be on board. I've seen many projects downtown, such as the one next to the metro of 205 luxury condos. I, I didn't hear any of these people that speak about housing um, talk about, a, you know, lobbying and active, uh, being activists for affordable housing in those areas. Um, we need to address housing for students. We need to address housing for families, for young families in particular. And we need to address housing for senior citizens that need accommodation. Um, but again, I don't hear any of this with this corridor plan. Um, this is still a corridor plan. And um, it's not clear to me that it's going to bring more affordable housing. And that's really what the true need is in our community. And I'm really sad to say that there's no discussion about transportation. Being on the Transportation Commission in particular, I found that very interesting because this is supposed to be transit-oriented development. This is supposed to be sustainable. There's been no discussion about the demographics, uh, looking at gentrification in our town, using the studies of UC Berkeley and Karen Chapel. Uh, there's a lot of data to show what's happening in our city right now. Time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there was a question from the previous speaker. Uh, my memory is so bad. I hope, uh, Sarah, you remember what it is. Yeah, um, Mr. Spidell asked about um, if we had looked at the neighborhoods adjacent to SoCal oh, Mission, right. if we were considering creating some transition zones and sort of up zoning those neighborhoods so we didn't have um, such a stark contrast between what's you know, planned for those streets and what's uh, currently built behind them in terms of single family neighborhoods. Um, great question. The answer is no, we have not looked at that. That would be a general plan amendment. And um, at this point, this, this project is really just focused on zoning and getting um, design and development standards into our zoning code. Um, opportunities to update the general plan will be, you know, sort of on the horizon in the next, you know, decade. Typically, you start a general plan update about five years before your current general plan expires. So that has us looking at 2025 to sort of start that work. Um, and, you know, that certainly could be one of the further, you know, refinements to our land use pattern that comes out of that process. But that's a really big, you know, long involved community wide process thinking about where does development belong, what type of development belongs in what location. So um, that's not part of this project. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to close the public uh, discussion part of the, uh, the public testimony part of the um, meeting and bring the matter back before the commission for discussion and potential action. Um, is there somebody who would like to go first? Um, as usual, okay, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Spellman, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I want to thank staff and all the consultants as well. I mean, obviously, this is heavy lifting in a short period of time to try and, you know, wrap our heads around, you know, where we're headed. How can we be more uh, open and equal in our participation in our city process? Uh, so I'm really encouraged on, on many levels uh, about this. And I'm also um, I'll just sort of throw out how my, my thought process works, right? Um, I think we're, I think this is definitely a continuation of the corridors plan on a lot of levels. I think we've, we've lost quite a bit of time in the interim of sort of squelching that process and having to pick up the pieces now and sort of being forced um, based on state law to, to address many issues. Um, I thought we were getting very close on the quarters plan. I know it was controversial. The height at five stories was, you know, causing a lot of angst in the community. Um, but I think we were about to dig into um, 
defining what it is you know, we want our city to be and getting into the neighborhoods of SoCal and Branch of 40 and uh, even Ocean and Mission and doing the real work to understand what those places are and how we can craft zoning language to define them. Um, and that's what I was hoping we were going to get to with the objective standards. And I think we're, we're touching on it. Um, things like, uh, you know, the public realm and the streets, um, sidewalk width, interaction with the roadway and bike traffic and people traffic. Um, there's very little language uh, in, in what we have before us on those issues other than say, you know, a minimum sidewalk width. Um, but that doesn't really get us to that definition of, okay, what, what is defining, say, downtown, midtown areas along SoCal, right, as opposed to, you know, those same types of conditions along Mission? What, what are the real, you know, architectural articulations and widths of walkways? You know, there are different um, street conditions, there are different walking conditions. Um, I was hoping that we were going to get into that kind of differentiation, and, and maybe we will. Um, I think the process that's been started that has added the voices of our community, and albeit we still need to add more to that, um, but just understanding who's not represented, right, allows us to go out and, and, and make those voices heard. And I think we would have a you know, a more balanced approach to what we're, we're trying to understand. Um, you know, as a professional who deals in a lot of these code issues, you know, on a daily basis, this is a lot of information to try and digest, right? It's, it's fairly abstract. Um, you know, complex ideas, even the way things are broken down into diagrams, I think are pretty dangerous, right? I think showing images of actual buildings that are doing what you're proposing is a much clearer way to communicate what you are asking or what you're asking somebody who's not educated in these terms to actually make an opinion on, right? Just a cartoonish box building that is showing modulation in a very abstract way. I don't think that's, that's helpful, right? As opposed to a photograph of an actual project where you can show, okay, this building is doing this. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of comments. I think some of our few participants tonight have been very spot on in some of the observations, right? I think you know, the corridor plan has been brought up by, by several of the members um, as this feeling like that process. And I think the reality is, is we have to face these hard issues. And if we put it off before, it hasn't gone away, right? We, we've got to figure out a way to address it. Um, and I do think we have to be extremely focused on how we're going to achieve more affordable housing in this community. Um, and if there are, um, you know, that, that should be the lens that we're approaching some of these decisions, I, I question some of the um, topics that were brought up, right? If we're potentially limiting development, how do we reconcile that concept of, um, of more housing, more units? If it, on the face of it, it appears that we're decreasing potential density and, and, and unit count. I don't know the answers. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there as a, as a comment. Um, so I think this information takes three, four readings, understandings to get through it. Again, even for myself, who has been through this information probably three times fully in the past week and listening to your presentation again tonight, it's, 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 it's thick stuff. And it's, it, on some level, it's very hard to be asked to make a critique on, on specifics when, you know, the big picture still seems like it's in its forming stages. And that's, that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Um, 
if I could go, you know, I I, I want to agree with uh, much of I think where I, what, where I think Commissioner Spellman is coming from, if I'm understanding your comments correctly. Um, as the staff has said, the state has focused on housing production, but there are other concerns as well. And, you know, my sense is the goal is to try to find a meaningful balance between a uh, variety of the, the, the range of concerns that exist for making our community a desirable community for everyone who lives here. And, you know, I just want to make a couple of comments about uh, some of the things that were said in the staff report. Racism has certainly been a reality, but it is intimately connected to housing affordability. Um, housing affordability is really the key, and it disproportionately uh, falls um, on the, the, the problem, disproportionately tends to fall on uh, various ethnic groups, given the demographics in our culture. And um, I think it's ironic uh, given the relationship between race, ethnicity, and income, that the state is focusing so much more on market rate housing, which low income people of, uh, cannot, are unable to afford, rather than requiring statewide a greater um, uh, level of affordability. So we're now ending up with projects um, that have less than what has traditionally been since the passage of Measure A the city standard of 15% of the housing uh, larger projects be affordable. We're not, with density bonuses, we're getting less than that. I think that is, um, is very unfortunate. From my perspective, simply approving objective standards for site design and building design, while I agree with many of them, um, I think it's insufficient, especially since state law now so severely limits local discretion uh, over housing development. Uh, I think that uh, my own feeling is that because it's so complicated, because it's so it's such a uh, sort of significant issue, um, I, I, I I think we we should take more time on it. I understand the staff wants to move it forward, uh, and uh, I think that one of the the concerns here is that there are two. Um, processes that are going on at the same time. One is the, one is the contract with the uh, consultant, which is really focused on uh, building design and site design, and that's understandable. But the other thing that's going on is that this is our opportunity to really um, uh, consider those kinds of standards that are necessary to, um, you know, to be able to have some assurance that um, the new development is not going to overwhelm, um, overwhelm the community. Uh, I think there are things that we can do in terms of affordable housing. I think there are things that can be done in terms of um, quality of life and in terms of environmental sustainability. Um, I submitted a list of potential potential. Uh, suggested additional standards in these three categories. I submitted them to staff. I can't submit them to the public correspondence because I've been told by the city attorney that that's a violation of the Brown Act. So I couldn't submit them earlier to either the commission or the public, um, but I did ask the staff to have them ready to be put up because I think this is our opportunity to need uh, to, to look at objectives potential objective standards in a much uh, broader, with a much broader lens than what we have before us. Uh, for instance, I looked at, in the, uh, in the general plan, there are all sorts of policies about the conservation policies. Not one of them would be considered an objective standard. Uh, it's minim to minimize land movement, it's to, um, you know, there are, I, I can't remember them all, of, uh, of hand, but what I tried to do in uh, coming up with some additional suggestions, which I'm not, you know, these are things that I think need um, a review to see whether they, um, whether other people agree with them, whether they really are objective standards, or, and whether they're, um, you know, they move in the direction where I think a number of people have said we'd like to 
move, including staff, that there are other concerns that need to be uh, brought into the picture, whether they're traffic uh, transportation concerns, um, and whether they're, um, they're environmental concerns or whether they're affordable housing concerns. Uh, and, you know, I think it is important also to keep in mind that all of this um, is in the context of the density bonus law, which from my perspective, in many ways makes the mockery of um, objective standards because the density bonus law allows for a waiver or concession to eliminate every objective standard. So we're going to go through an exercise, which I think we should, to recognize what the values are of our community and come up with some standards to uh, fulfill those uh, priorities, but recognize that um, we're ve we have very limited ability to afford enforce them um, due to the, due to the um, density bonus law. I would like to say, since a number of people have brought, uh, brought up the corridor's plan, that it might, be, uh, it might be helpful to remind the commission of a council action that accompanied the direction to terminate the, uh, the corridor's plan. And the objectives of what staff was to do was to reconcile the zoning code in the general plan and to do two things, preserve and protect residential areas and existing city businesses as the city's highest level policy priority and to encourage appropriate new residential and mixed use development, specifically including enhanced affordable housing at appropriate locations along the city's main transportation corridors. And I think the, what we've got uh, presented to us tonight is a good step in, in that direction. Uh, I, uh, could I, I, I sent my um, proposals to Matt. Is it possible to sort of put them up, Matt, to, uh, uh, to share the screen so that? Sure, I, I can pull them up, Yeah. You have that, sir? Okay. Yeah. Can everyone see that? Is it big enough? I can. So I, I, I divided the standards into uh, three categories, affordability, quality of life, and then at the bottom of the page is environmental uh, sustainability. And you know, my sense is that you know, as projects get bigger, their affordability requirement should increase. And um, I, I made some suggestions about since um, the law prevents um, applying inclusionary requirements to total price to density bonus units uh, and only to base density. I think, um, and as uh, if if projects are going to go for if we're going to get large projects, and if we're going to um, you know, see density bonus continue to be used, the, the affordability uh, requirements should, uh, should increase. Uh, I have a, you know, I tried to come up with a standard for solar access. I know that Steph talked about uh, their struggling with uh, shading, and um, you know, I think it's worth looking at what, you know, what, how to protect adjacent residents' um, uh, solar access. Trying to limit structures, can, you know, uh, the ones that are here are related to um, the trying to have some recognition of what's, uh, what's going on around the, the project. Um, the, Having some noise level, noise standards, um, having some PDM requirements for um, and, and increased fees for very large projects that are going to generate additional traffic, um, acquiring more usable bicycles um, for a large project, and then you know requiring certain kinds of community uh, gathering places. For 50 plus units, um, you know these I think should be at least considered in the mix. Um, and then um, why the sidewalks um, on collector and serial streets? And then 
what I try to do with environmental, um, the environmental sustainability is to suggest standards um, that were related to the climate action plan that, you know, require that there be documentation that the city stormwater drainage and air quality standards will be met uh, at, the, at the discretionary or ministerial approval stage so that um, the project doesn't get approved before it's clear that those standards are going to be met. Again, trying to have to really push for climate action with uh, requiring meeting building uh, green building standards, although I'm not sure how much um, the, that changes what the current re requirements are. Uh, the next ones are all kind of trying to convert the general plans conservation standards into um, into objective standards because they're now all um, considered and they are discretionary standards. So I would ask that the, you know, the commission agree to refer these to the staff for, for consideration. I also want to add that uh, Rick Hyman, Mr. Hyman submitted a long letter with a number of, also proposing a number of objective standards. And I think they should be responded to. Um, maybe they don't work. Maybe they're contrary to state law. Maybe the ones that I'm asking for are contrary or suggesting are contrary to state law. But I think they do represent a more, uh, um, more comprehensive approach to dealing with what seems to be under the housing, what's now called the Housing Crisis Act, the only area where the city can have uh, any kind of discretion over what kind of development it comes into the city. Let me say one final thing to respond to uh, the staff um, request for input in terms of what should be the um, what should be the, the the process for looking at at these projects and whether we should really try to you know minimize, make them more ministerial, minimize the public hearings. I think the 831 Water Street um, project is a, is a really good example of why we should do that. Objectives, there are different ways to interpret whether objective standards have been met or not. And um, the staff can have one opinion about whether objective standards are met. And in the case of 831 Water Street, the council had another opinion about whether the city's objective standards have been met. And to sort of take out the public role take out the role of the elected officials, I think is a mistake. Um, and uh, I would not support moving in that direction. So thank you for letting me uh, submit my, um, or, or for considering the, the, the additional projected proposed objective standards. And those are my comments. Anybody, any, com any commissioners want to respond or the staff want to respond? I've bared my soul here, so now it's your turn to uh, tell me what you think. Um, I can just give some high level responses. So, you know, we could definitely take these, you know, and integrate them into the feedback we received and take a look at, you know, which of these maybe we can implement under the state law. Several of these are things that are already accomplished in the zoning ordinance. So, um, you know, We'll double check and make sure that they're fully um, objective that as they're currently written. But we do, you know, we have a whole slopes ordinance and grading and geologic hazards regulation. So, you know, I, I do think a lot of that is accomplished already in the zoning ordinance. Um, but, you know, we can certainly take these under advisement and look and, you know, see which which ones are possible to integrate. There's certainly a lot of really good ideas here. Thank you. And I, would that include uh, Mr. Hyman? suggestions as well? Yeah, I've, I've actually, I've emailed with Rick a little bit about those. Um, and, you know, one of the things, one of the things that he's really focused on is um, transitions between intense uses and adjacent single family homes. And that's going to be a, like a, a significant component of the engagement that we are doing 
around all of these objective standards is that we want more feedback from folks about how do we manage that transition. Rick has been really explicit and clear about how he, you know, wants it to go and thinks it ought to go, and they're certainly very well thought out ideas. Um, and so we've we've created a, a question to actually ask the broader community about that. Like, are we, you know, what's the best way to handle this setback? We need to we'll need to do based on that feedback we get from the public. We'll need to do some allowance uh, analysis and make sure that we're balancing, you know, the FAR with the height with the sort of setback or like um, daylighting plane or, or step back increases that folks are most interested in seeing to sort of address those transitions. Um, because we do want to make sure that we aren't reducing housing capacity. You know, that is like a primary goal of this project. That's a requirement under the state law is that we are achieving that 2.75 FAR in such a way that housing can be built and developed. So. Um, Yes, we are taking all of that feedback in. You're not going to see all of it word for word, you know, show up in the standards. Um, and, you know, I'm happy to talk with individuals or, you know, I'll, I can email with Rick again about some more of those standards. Um, and the same, you know, we heard some comments about the, um, uh, from the Save Our Big Trees. And I just want to point out, you know, all of those standards aren't reflected in the standards here. And what we did do is that we did, what I, the, the crux of what that was, was about preserving heritage trees. And one of the best ways we can do that is by allowing more flexibility in terms of how a site can be um, constructed so that you can like push a building around an existing tree and maintain it in, in place. And um, so what we did is that we have a standard for when you're counting the open space, any area that's under the canopy of the tree counts double. So that there's an incentive to keep that space that's under the tree as part of your landscaping. We also kind of looked into, um, you know, there were some, some suggestions in those standards about um, uh, requiring that trees be relocated. And we talked to our urban forester and discussed the feasibility of that and, and the Sort of consensus around that in the arborist community is that it's not usually very successful with mature trees and so you know some of that didn't end up being incorporated but just long story long we have gotten a lot of really good suggestions from folks we are definitely analyzing them and taking them into account and incorporating them where we where we can and when you see this package come back for adoption you're going to see these objective you know sort of site design building design standards and then there are going to be a bunch of other little code amendments you know we're going to like Making our archaeology, archaeology, art studies, like you have to comply with the findings of the art study. So we have an objective standard that you have to do one, but currently the standard that requires that you, you know, incorporate those mitigations into the project is not objective. So we're going to fix that. Um, and I think there's going to be, I think some of these things that are in the list here from Chair Schifrin um, are in kind of that category. So they exist in other places in the zoning code, and we'll be taking a closer look to uh, make sure that that language is really um, tightened up. Thank you. Are there comments from other commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Spellman and Commissioner Nielsen and Commissioner Greenberg. Yeah, mine is brief just on that point. I mean, I, you know, I appreciate the effort to put to paper, you know, some of your thoughts around where some of these objective standards should be focused. Uh, and Mr. Hyman as well. But I would also say, I think we're in the discovery phase still. I mean, I think those are opinions and those are our thoughts, right? But I don't think they should dictate, you know, code at this point. I think we need to, where is our collective voice and how are we gonna get there, I think is, is important here. <laughs> I agree they're not, they're suggestions for consideration. Commissioner Nielsen. Uh, I would agree with that, um, definitely. Um, I, I think um, one other thing that um, I just wanted to talk about was this idea of, you know, maybe doing administrative approval or, you know, um, I think one of the one of the things about this is, you know, obviously we're trying to get to a place where, where things are more objective and, and as, you know, as, Chair Schiffrin said, I mean, even, even objective standards can be interpreted different ways. Um, 
and that's true. I mean, it, it, they can be. And um, but the more that we can get to a place where there's they're you know a little more solidified and uh, and objective, I think is the the right move. And more, I think the reason why I feel that way is from a developer side, they're really they 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 it's important for them to, to have predictability in the process um, because if it's not predictable, then it just it ends up being more costly. And to be able to actually produce the housing that we're trying to get. And and we saw we saw this in our last meeting. I mean where with with the um, with the center street project where the developer just wanted to know that there, there was not going to be a um, an appeal. I mean, you know, obviously we don't have control over that, um, but um, but that was their objective because they want predictability. And so, um, so I, I think this process needs to take that into account as well, where where it is, it, it, and maybe it's. I guess what I'm getting at is I think there I think there has to be a place for uh, administrative review in some cases, and maybe the 831 Water Street project would not is not a good example for that because maybe the size of that project, but maybe maybe it has to do with you know different sizes could be possible for them to be able to go through administratively um, if they meet the objective standards, and um, so. Uh, um, I just wanted to, you know, bring, you know, kind of from the, I guess, from the point of view of the developer, that that the predictability is really important in this process. So Commissioner Greenberg. Uh, yeah, thank you so much to Sarah and to the staff for this incredible work on this and the months and months of, of it, um, and, and really appreciate the presentation and the comments of my fellow commissioners and the, and the public. Um, on uh, Commissioner Nielsen's point, I would agree, and in thinking about um, 130 Center and, and the kind of que the question around it, um, ministerial review and the idea that um, an incentive is significant or, you know, for developers to uh, be able to expedite the approval process. And I think that, um, Planner Noisy, there's a um, point about how that is one, you know, one way we can think about the potential for affordability that is uh, that accompanies these objective standards. Um, I found that to be a compelling point, and I bring that up to say that um, I also find compelling points from the public and um, Chair Schifrin around, you know, what is the affordability bonus of going in this direction. Um, I know we can talk about, you know, approval processes and predictability. We can talk about, you know, the idea of affordability by design um, and that, you know, that there's conceivable, you know, if we can build more multifamily housing and more density, there's the potential for more affordability. And I think that there are certainly arguments along those lines. At the same time, um, you know, um, uh, Sarah brought up in the beginning this notion of the three Ps. And that you know, simply adding supply, simply adding, focusing on production, does not ensure that um, affordability uh, is going to be accompanying that. If in fact you're operating in an environment in which there's very limited tenant protections um, and, and so forth. So similarly, if you're operating in a production environment where we're so enormously dependent upon the private sector um, to provide the, the housing. If we were operating in an environment in which uh, we had much more state and federal funding for affordable housing um, and larger trust fund, uh, affordable housing trust fund, it's more conceivable that we would have more dense affordable development. Unfortunately, we're operating in this environment, um, as we know, and we're all hoping for the best out of the Build Back Better plan, um, in which there's very limited um, state and federal funding, and so we're dependent upon the private sector. So in that sense, um, you know, just given the kind of realities of our current moment um, and trying to think about, 
the impetus behind so much of this and the presentations that were done about exclusionary zoning, that were done about the history of redlining in our community, the history of the intersections of race um, and income and exclusion around housing, um, significance of the, of the public feedback and the priority that was placed on affordability and the hopes, the hopes for more inclusivity, more equity by doing this. I do think if there was any way, and given that we're operating in this kind of private market-driven um, housing development reality, um, if there was any way of including uh, objective standards in addition to expediting the process and so forth that, in, that emphasize affordability, um, that would be, I think, really compelling for a lot of folks for the, in the public who you know, put that as one of their top priorities and so forth. And I know that, um, and I guess a question I have really, and I'm really, um, I'm really intrigued by the suggestions of Chair Schifrin on the affordability front um, around whether projects with a base density of 50 or more units shall have a 25% inclusionary requirement, for instance, those kinds of ideas. Is that even something we can talk about? Is that something that is, um, you know, we, you, you know, you've mentioned that the the suggestions around uh, quality of life, the suggestions around sustainability, are things we can talk about, are things we can add. Are the are the proposed objective standards around affordability um, that stipulate, um, you know, for instance, expanding the inclusionary requirement and beyond simply affordability by design or through or procedural. Um, procedural uh, means, uh, i.e. expediting um, uh, approvals, are there other forms of regulation around affordability that can be considered um, objective standards uh, and that might allay concerns that, in fact, we're going to be densifying and we're going to be adding a lot of supply, but doing it in a way that is not necessarily affordable. Um, I think that that is a question that I have, and maybe, I don't know if this is a, a moment in which um, I, there can be any response to that. So I'm just wondering what your reaction might be to those ideas. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to respond to that. Um, yeah, so um, as we have mentioned previously, revisiting the inclusionary ordinance isn't scoped to be part of this process. We don't have the right staff or the right team um, involved to really do that study because it, it is something that involves a specialized kind of analysis to really take a look at. Um, and I certainly hear and understand that, you know, that's the most direct route to creating affordability, right, is to just increase that um, inclusionary percentage. But um, unfortunately, it's not always necessarily tied to the number of units that doesn't necessarily adjust that like yield on cost that a developer is trying to like pencil out projects with more units involve elevators they involve a lot more grading like they're just their economies of scale and the way that you know development kind of pushes and pulls on itself when you like add more units and then you have to add an elevator and then suddenly you need like a lot more units to make that work it's not a straight line and so, um, you know, the, the way that our inclusionary ordinance is currently set at, at 20% is, you know, we're, we're pretty sure that that can work well. We actually haven't studied that. Our last, last study that we did indicated that 15% was a more feasible option in order to make sure that development could continue to happen. Um, and I, you know, I absolutely hear that this is a concern. And I also want to just be clear that, you know, part of what got us into this challenge that we are in with housing is a failure to build multifamily housing. So by zoning so much of the city, so much of California and the nation for single family homes and excluding the type of housing that is called for in our general plan, that is called for by the state law, that is more likely to be affordable to lower income households, not guaranteed, but more likely in denser multifamily properties, um, it hasn't been created. And so we're taking a stab at rectifying that. And you're right that it doesn't guarantee affordability, but it starts to make it possible. Um, and so, you know, at this point with this project, that's what we're able to do. I mean, you can always discuss changing the inclusionary requirement, but that would require a different kind of study and a, and a nexus to be created. 
Right. Thank you, Sarah. So I just wanted to respond to you know comments from the public and so forth that are concerned with that and the suggestion from Chair Schifrin. Um, and so it sounds like, and I, I guess another corollary would be if we know of any other communities in the state who are also in the process of creating objective standards that have included, are there other means of producing affordability vis-a-vis -vis objective standards that we haven't considered? Um, and I don't know. I mean, I'm really curious to know if there are, <laughs> if there are other creative ways of considering that with, as an objective standard. Um, but I, I do see, yeah, there is a reality of affordability by design. I've said this in the past in this, in this space of, you know, I think density is necessary but not sufficient. Um, we need to increase density. We need to meet the capacities of these areas. We need it for affordability. We need it for sustainability. We need to create, you know, the capacity for the mass transit to be able to, to move along places that have enough ridership and so forth um, along corridors. So I, I think there's so many benefits um, to infill housing development, and I'm a huge, huge supporter of it. At the same time, um, I don't think it's a panacea, and I think that um, you know that we that we need to, if we're going to be going in this direction, be exceedingly and increasingly vigilant um, about finding other means to enable us to accompany this potential for development with affordability, and that might include means of increasing our own affordable housing trust fund um, so that we can pitch in more as a city. Um, it may mean, you know, uh, other forms of, uh, of regulation um, around rents and so forth to really be creative and thinking about how we can balance the three Ps in this, in this moment. Yeah. I'm just going to chime in here for a minute. I'm Dina Belzer and I'm with Strategic Economics. You all might have met my colleagues who just Sujata Srivastava. Um, Sujata has uh, moved over to work for a nonprofit, so I'm here tonight. Um, and I just want to say that there is a lot of evidence, academic evidence. Somebody cited Karen Chapel from UC Berkeley recently. Karen has moved on now to the University of Toronto, but she continues to work in this field. And some of her work shows that by continuing to produce housing, particularly at the high end, what happens is the people who can afford it move into those units and they often create that filtering process. So I think that there's a lot of um, indirect affordability that create, gets created across a spectrum. So it's not an either or density or affordability. And I think we should be really careful about not, again, assuming that this is kind of an all or nothing and that production also contributes to preservation. So I just want to make that yeah point. right and I you know that's it's in, I mean I didn't want to get into the weeds of that I mean I think that um, you know there is a report by Karen, Karen Chapel and Miriam Zook in response to an LOA report on the concept of filtering that is actually quite critical of the concept of filtering right well. it was con it was con con it was critical of the methodology but there's mm -hmm. more recent re so anyway so there again yeah. I think the most important thing is that anything we do to cut off supply even at the high end we're actually exacerbating the problem of affordability well I think there are certainly arguments for that um, there are also cases where um, the, the gentrifying effects might mean that we're going to change the, the nature of the, you know, the, the AMI of this community. Um, and I think she also found that. So she found that in TODs, transit-oriented development, that did not include affordability, it actually had this contradictory effect of driving out low-income people to outlying areas where they were more likely to drive cars while attracting high-income people who were more likely to drive cars into the, into the center of the city, thus increasing greenhouse gas emissions for the region. So I think that she's somebody who I am, have worked with and, and really agree with in linking the importance of ideas of affordability and density. Um, and so uh, at the same time, there are market dynamics that certainly, you know, supply matters. I totally agree with that. But I think, um, and I just, I, I, I don't want to be a broken record here, but that we, um, if we're going to go in this really pro-density direction in this town statewide, um, we have to find additional means 
statewide, not just at the city level, but statewide and federally, obviously, as well, to increase um, equity and affordability alongside of that. I agree with that. So, um, I thank you. Are there other commissioners who would like to weigh in here? Have any comments? Yes, Commissioner Conway. Yeah, thank you. And uh, again, I really want to thank the staff and the consultants. I think that this is an amazing piece of work. Um, and it's been said by many people, but the fact that we actually understand who's participating um, in our community feedback is, it just can't be overstated how important that is. And um, thank you for the passion that you brought to um, and the commitment to making that bringing us forward in that it's about time. Um, I also want to um, thank you for prioritizing the importance of making rental housing feasible and especially um, making small rental projects feasible. And um, I think it's a point that can get buried in the very large um, amount scope that's happening here. But what I appreciate about that is that it's recognizing what our actual land use patterns are and um, establishing some policies um, that uh, say that rental housing is important to us. And you did it in a way that um, incentivizes, and I think that this can help a little bit with some of the angst we're feeling about the density bonus. Um, and some of the way state law is handled. But if we can find ways to um, incentivize just following the rules as we want them as a community uh, without you know, going to density bonus and sort of the state imposed rules, I feel like that's a pretty big win. Um, and again, I think that in the context of, of what actually happens in our land use pattern that makes it really important. Um, so let's see, um, this is a big project. Um, I hear a lot of us saying that it's not as big as we can imagine it being. Um, and as maybe we've even tried to bite off um, before, we know we need to create this tool. It's, um, it's a really important tool for our community creating objective standards is going to help us going forward. Um, even if it, and, and as far as I'm concerned, we can't do it fast enough. So keeping this process moving, um, you've done some really important work here. Um, I think we've also identified that there's a lot of important conversations that we wanna um, have uh, happen going forward. Um, the staff report also raised some really specific questions that um, I don't know that we've, we've wrestled with. Maybe this isn't the time to start um, raising them, but I think that they were some important questions to have in, um, you know, the, the conversation about just, you know, where do we put this thing? Is it going to be in the code? Is it going to be a separate document that we can maybe manage differently? Um, and there's, I think that's, I think that's a really useful question. Uh, our conversation tonight has gone in a different direction, so um, I'm not going to start digging through those now. Um, but thank you for identifying them. I know that they're going to con continue to come up in um, the uh, future conversations around completing this project. I also think that we've, what we brought up tonight um, are uh, raising some future work, um, but I, I also want to thank the members of the public that uh, participated, you know, all of them, the ones that I really hardly agree with and the ones that not so much, because I know we all love our community, right? But um, all of everything that we're doing, are po these are policy choices, and they've resulted in the community that we have, and we know it can be better. We know we love our community, and we know we can do it better. Within, um, by addressing a lot of things and a lot of policies. So um, I think always being aware of that is, um, is important. And this project does this both in the way that you've approached it and in many of the questions that you've raised. And 
again, I really want to thank all of you, including um, my fellow commissioners, on um, your thoughtfulness in um, reading this uh, uh, voluminous material. And great presentation. Thank you. Anyone else? Before we close, okay, Commissioner Nielsen, go ahead. I just want to say one last thing. Um, that that um, just listening to everyone's um, thoughts on this just kind of brought it to light for me. Um, and maybe this was kind of touched on earlier, but um, these are, what we're talking about are objective standards. And in, in a way, when I when I look at that or think about that, it's kind of it's a way of regulating. Um, and what and so what I had in my mind is what if we flip that? What if we were to flip that? And this this was this is kind of revolving around the the um, the affordable housing piece. But what if we flipped it around and we were we were to think about objective incentives rather than maybe objective standards? Um, is there is there some? And I it may, this may not be necessarily within the scope of this process and with these consultants, but something to think about, like because um, because we we we're all trying to get something, and um, and in order to get it, we may need to give some things up. And, and, and I don't know what that is, but it, but it would be, but but um, to um, the what what um, Sarah was was expressing earlier about the tree when she was talking about the heritage trees, the idea of being able to give double the outdoor space or for that for you know underneath a, an existing tree that to me that's kind of moving in that direction of like incentivizing keeping the tree rather than saying you have to keep the tree for these reasons, but like incentivizing those things. So I think that that would be, I think that's a really good example of kind of this idea of incentivizing. So that was just a thought I had. Thank you. Other commissioners? Yes, Commissioner Greenberg. Oh, that's a really interesting idea, Commissioner Nielsen, and I'm just wondering if did you have ideas along those lines um, for incentivizing affordability, or I don't know if you had any or have heard think, of such well, a little bit? I mean, I objective just objective standards. I yeah, as it relates to objective standards, I, my thought was okay. Well, for talking about um, wanting to make things predictable for a developer, like being like maybe there is some incentive to you know if you provide a certain um, amount of affordability, you can go straight through without a public hearing. Maybe there is some sort of way to do that. Um, or maybe there's other things that can be um, reduced out of the out of what the of what the zoning is, like parking, for example. I mean, maybe that's another one. I, I mean, we know that parking is very expensive, right? You know, for in, in development. And if the, if you know, if if, you, if more affordability was was provided, maybe the parking could be reduced, or you know, things you know, things along those lines. If that's an option, that's Thank a you. great question. Is that so? I, this is along the lines of creative thinking <laughs> around affordability, and that's an interesting one. I don't know if that, if that's something that communities have used as an objective standard, those kinds of incentives. Um, well, so. Those incentives are already built into the state density bonus. So you hit a certain level of affordability in the state density bonus, you don't have to provide any parking at all in many locations. So like that, when, when we talk about incentives around affordability, all of that is gonna intertwine with what's already built into the state density bonus. And I'm hearing a lot of concern about the state density bonus. So, you know, we'd wanna, we just need to like think through all of those factors, you know, like if we if we automatically require a 30% inclusionary requirement for certain projects, every all of them are now density bonus projects at a very high level, right? So that all of these things relate and kind of come back to each other. And that state density bonus law is like it is it's so um, what I'm looking for. It incentivizes so much that that trying to think about ways to like get at affordability that don't trigger it, I 
think it's really challenging. I mean, I'm, I am yeah. absolutely open to suggestions. I, I, I know that this is a, a concern from the community. Um, and, and also I know that the state law is really clear, but I see Kristen just jumped in like she maybe had something to add. I was just gonna say, I think in a lot of ways, that's what the concessions and waivers are about. It's about letting individual developers sort of tell you what they need in order to make a project work. And I think, I mean, I don't know how often you guys have seen this in Santa Cruz, but we're hearing this all over, that um, a lot of times they're using the density bonus without even actually going for the density just so they can get the streamlining process. And mm -hmm. so to your point about predictability, you know, this suite of laws has kind of enabled developers to identify the things that they would need in order to incentivize um, them to build projects. And I, I understand that it makes it um, definitely a different process for review, but I think that in a lot of ways was, is kind of the intent that the, that it allows them to select the incentive concessions and streamlining that would be helpful for them to be able to get the projects through. And, and I'll just add that this is something we talked a lot about as we were developing these standards. You know, how does it, how would these work if there was a density bonus on top of this? Or what are the things that people might ask for concessions and waivers from, should we try to make it so that we have, we're making the most feasible possible development so that people don't need to ask for a lot of concessions and waivers, but what are the places where we're hearing it is really important for the community to have certain features retained, like the architectural detailing is a place where it was pretty clear, it, not just in the survey, but also in the focus groups and the various conversations we have, that that's a place where people do wanna make sure we hold on to a few things. So. It's just kind of careful. I have no sound. No, I think the sound just cut because it's it cut when the one lady was talking. I think they can all hear each other, but I can't hear anybody. Zoom related, because I can get sound, but not from them. I can put sound over the air, but it's not theirs. Oh, good. So it's from from the Zoom. You might want to text them or something, or just interrupt them and tell them they're having, they're having sound problems. Yeah.
coming up with policies that maximize the amount of uh, affordable housing that we can get, or at least optimizing it. And as we see with density bonuses that nothing. are essentially getting to the, you know, what like currently now can increase that by 50%, um, <laughs> I think it makes sense to uh, be considering my boss increases oh, to the density bonus requirement. And we can do it now. It's a political decision. Um, if we ask consultants who um, always say you can't do it, uh, they'll say we can't do it. But we have done it, and it's, I think it's working. So I think we need to consider continuing to do it even more. Okay, so that's my final bias speech. So there's no action that we need to take. Let's move on to the next item. I want to thank the consultants for all their work. I want to thank staff. Um, one thing I learned tonight, if nothing else, is that it really was a yeoman's job to get all this uh, information before us. Uh, I wondered why it was taking so long. It was supposed to come in August. Um, I now understand uh, that such a delay was not unreasonable. So let's move on to item number four, which is to consider proposed changes to the uh, Planning Commission bylaws. Um, we've all received the um, proposed changes. They're pretty minor. Uh, Sarah, are you going to do the staff report? Um, It'll take less than a minute, Chair, if you all need it. Um, you have it pretty, pretty plainly there. It's a request from Bonnie to update um, the terms for efficiency, consistency, and clarity in her office, um, as well as making the language gender, gender neutral. So pretty straightforward. Happy to be here if you do have any questions. I only actually have one question. Um, the language in section two, the membership year, was a little confusing. It says the membership year shall be from the first month of the first commission meeting after the, oh, I, it was changed to be from February 1st to January 31st of yeah. each year. But that doesn't make any sense because February 1st comes January, in other words, if it starts on January, uh, February 1st, January 31st is the next year. So I think Bonnie's providing time for it to go to council to make sure it's appointed. I don't have any problem with the process. It's just mm -hmm. that the wording seems weird. The wording seems to be that it's going to be from February 1st to, Jan to January 31st of each year. But it's not. It's from February 1st to January 31st. Of the following. The following year. Yeah, we can update that to make that clear. So, yeah, okay. that was the only thing that sort of threw me for a loop. Do any other okay. commissioners have any comments on this item? Is there any member of the public who wants to speak to this item? Um, so, would somebody like to make a motion to approve the staff recommendation with that one minor change to the Section two. I'll move to do to do that. Is there a second? A second. Is there any discussion? Okay, let's have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Dawson. Aye. Greenberg. Aye. Wilson. Aye. Bellman? Aye. Griffin? Aye. That is unanimously. <clears throat> we'll now move on to um, item five, the potential pursuit of a new commercial linkage, linkage affordable housing impact fee. I put that on the agenda and I really want to apologize to Commissioner Greenberg. Uh, we worked together on this. Uh, I did a draft, she, uh, she approved it, and it probably should have been from both of us. So um, I never, it didn't occur to me until after it was on the agenda. So this is uh, a, a recommendation that the commission recommends to the city council that they initiate the process to adopt a commercial linkage fee to fund affordable housing. 
and direct the chairperson to write a letter to the mayor requesting consideration of this recommendation at the next council meeting. This is, you know, this is something that somehow I think just got overlooked. Uh, at least it appears to me that it has. The council, the, ca the county of Santa Cruz has had a commercial linkage fee for, which I think is called a non-residential uh, affordable housing fee for, uh, I think Ju uh, Commissioner Conway was involved in um, the adoption of that requirement and the city of Watsonville has it. It certainly uh, seems a reasonable thing to ask uh, and I, I, I don't particularly think it should apply to very small commercial developments, but larger commercial developments that are providing a significant, significant number of jobs should be helping to provide some affordable housing because many of those jobs are for um, lower income employees. So uh, Commissioner Greenberg, did you want to add anything? I'm not going to go through the letter given the lateness of the hour and uh, wanting to get to commission discussion. Um, yeah, no, I, um, I'm really glad this seems to be um, uh, a very common and popular uh, policy that is increasingly, if it doesn't already exist, is in many cases is being upgraded or is being um, added um, in jurisdictions throughout our region, including most of the jurisdictions in the Bay Area, Silicon Valley have been adding these um, these uh, ordinances and particularly in a situation in which we're seeing additional commercial development um, and that commercial development is geared towards providing jobs. That's you know, one of the reasons we want commercial development. Um, and so it's in many ways um, considered kind of a smart growth policy. It's, it's kind of a win-win in the sense that um, the commercial entities, the employers want to know that their employees are going to have a place to live Obviously, we want to know that um, we're not going to have increasing commuting um, to get into, you know, people aren't going to be displaced to outlying regions, as we were saying before, and people can live close to their jobs. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's an environmental policy, it's an economic development policy, and it's a policy oriented towards equity in our community. Um, as we were saying, there's, there's so few means of funding besides the private sector and, and helping developers We'll do the right thing. We have so little often um, on the city side to add to our affordable housing trust fund, and this is another means of doing that. So it seems like a smart way to go. So I'm hoping we can we can work on that. So. Okay, um, let's start with questions, maybe comments from commissioners, and then see if anybody in the public wants to speak to this, and then uh, we can have consideration by the uh, commission. Um, Commissioner Conway, did you want to comment? Do you have a question? Uh, I, I'll comment later. Thank you. You're right. Okay. Are there any questions on the proposed uh, action? Why don't we see if there's any, is there anybody in the public? Yes. Uh, Raphael Sonnenfeld, uh, you have your hand up. You have three minutes. Yeah, um, I just wanted to um, generally support this idea. Um, I think it's a pretty common sense thing. Uh, for our community uh, to create more opportunities for affordable housing. Um, I, I, I do hope that it's, it's looked at to make sure that it's not like a, a detriment to, um, to commercial development in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, we do want to be adding um, more jobs in our community along with more affordable housing. And I would hope that you know, we don't set a, a fee that's too high that uh, that um, kills that possibility for for more jobs. So, so you know, the nexus study that goes along with this linkage fee is going to be really important. Um, that's really all I had to say. Otherwise, I think it's a smart move. Thank you, uh, Vera Filippini. Uh, you're up. Hi. Yeah, I just want to say I have a huge amount of support for this potential. I want to thank um, Commissioner Greenberg and everyone else who supports this and agree with Rafa. I think it's really important that we increase funds for affordable housing. Coming from the commercial sector makes a lot of sense, but we do need to balance it because we know that part of our long-term sustainability does also involve the commercial sector and making sure that it's not too burdensome for them. So create 
allocating the right amount um, for sustainability for our overall future is really crucial. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other hands. I'm going to bring it back to the uh, comm commission, Commissioner uh, Conway. Yeah, thank you for bringing this up, first of all. Um, and I, um, I agree with what um, Rafa Sonnefeld said. This will need to be uh, supported by a nexus study. The crux of the whole matter really is nexus and proportionality. And I appreciate that you um, attached the study from, or the uh, nexus study from the county from 2014. That was also a lot of work and went through a lot of process. I'm sure everyone had time to read it. Um, and uh, realize that what it found is that all development creates a need for housing for people with lower incomes. And I'm wondering if, um, and I don't, I don't in any way mean to make this more complicated. But I feel like it's fairly straightforward, but it will require a nexus study. Um, one of the things that the county found is that a substantial driver of the need for affordable housing is the development of market rate housing. So in other words, People who live in market rate housing rely on people in service fields, construction, education, and many of which are lower income. I'm wondering if you would consider including an examination um, of the, a housing impact fee for single family development on a per square foot basis, meaning that smaller houses will pay a low cost per square foot because we don't want to make it harder to build but that larger houses will pay a higher cost per square foot. Um, and I do think that in a meaningful way, this could incentivize the construction of smaller homes. And it also um, would create, um, would, would add to affordable housing funds. Um, taking a quick look at the, what happened with the county's um, housing impact fees, they've collected more money through their um, uh, graduated residential impact fee um, than through the commercial impact fee. So again, I don't want to make it more complicated. Um, if it's more straightforward to go ahead with simply a commercial linkage fee, um, I'd be supportive of that. But I wonder if we should think about it if we're opening up that next. Um, if, if I could respond, I think it's a really good idea. I'm wondering whether it whether it would be better to keep this kind of simple and maybe refer that idea to the housing subcommittee and have it come back to the commission as sort of a thought through proposal that then could be moved up to the council. Cause I think it's, uh, I think um, it is a really good suggestion, but my sense is it will just create confusion yeah. uh, 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 if we tried to add it to this. So, um, don't mean to bog it down by any means. <laughs> that that would be what I would suggest. Is there any other discussion by um, members of the commission? Would somebody like to make a uh, Commissioner Dawson? Yeah, I would just like to go ahead and make a motion that we, uh, the commission, recommend to the city council that they initiate the process of commercial linkage fee to fund affordable housing. Um, and direct uh, chairperson of the Planning Commission to write a letter to the mayor requesting consideration of this recommendation at the next city council meeting. Is there a second? I'll second that. Is there any discussion? Um, well, I would just add, I, I really appreciate Commissioner Conway's point, um, and that's really interesting and good to know. And, um, you know, I, and insofar as we're going to be recreating this, uh, affordable housing subcommittee, maybe that's the way to go, but I think that we should really explore that in our region and elsewhere. I mean, I think that, um, that there, you know, there may be feelings about the fees that residential developers are already facing and so forth, and um, it might affect the, you know, how people feel about um, a, a commercial linkage and residential development linkage fee, but, um, but I would support that, you know, if, if that's feasible and if that's something that people can support. I think um, the Nexus study idea is um, makes a lot of sense. I know that in the Bay Area, they actually 
fundraise through the community foundation to do a, um, a nexus study, because I know it can sometimes be um, expensive and time consuming and cumbersome and was hard for the county. And so it's conceivable we, there could also be fundraising to support and fund a nexus study that might not only be for our community, but be for other communities in our region, like the other four cities, for instance, in the county. Um, if, I know that Watsonville already has, has this underway, has already done this, but um, for, other, for other places to join in and do an economy of scale around a nexus study. So um, that's just an idea, but certainly and that could be a part of this. There's no further discussion. Um, could we have a roll call uh, vote on the motion? Commissioner Conway? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Nielsen? Aye. Bellman? Aye. Griffin? Aye. That's just unanimously. We'll now move on to item number six, establishment of an ad hoc subcommittee to review a proposed flexible density unit ordinance. Um, this came out of our discussion uh, last meeting of the flexible density unit and small unit uh, proposals. Um, and so what I would recommend uh, is that we just reestablish the if the members are still willing to be on it, reestablish the committee, the subcommittee that existed, um, but I don't think met more than once uh, over the last six months or so uh, because staff was so involved in other things. So um, subcommittee was Commissioner Greenberg, Commissioner Conway, and myself. Is uh, Are the two of you still willing to be on the subcommittee? You know, um, I think I'm going to um, decline at this time, Chair. Um, I just I don't think that I have um, the capacity to do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, thank you for all the work you've done on it in the past. Uh, Commissioner Greenberg, do you still um, want to be on it? I'm happy to. If others want to, I'm also happy to. You know, I don't know if we want to have a discussion about others who might want to be on it, but I would be willing to be on it. Well, there's one uh, vacant uh, vacant seat. Uh, is there are there other commissioners who would like to be on the housing subcommittee? Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, I um I would like to throw my hat in the ring for consideration. I'm not seeing anybody else volunteering. So the Housing Subcommittee will be Commissioner Greenberg, Commissioner Dawson, and myself. And um, I think is it uh, maybe we can have a get a meeting set up and not too distant future so we could get a report on the have a discussion on the flexible density unit. But I would also say uh, I'd also like to add that we uh, discuss Commissioner Conway's notion of a graduated uh, uh, housing, affordable housing fee for smaller units. Does somebody want to, yes, Commissioner Stone. For larger units, larger units. Yeah, I just have a general comment. I mean, I, on, do you have a sense for what the actual scope is for the committee? I mean, the, the proposal was for a flexible density unit, bedding, let's call it, of that proposal. I would hope that maybe you would come back to the uh, commission with some sense of what you think the scope of work would be for, for what you guys are going to do. Sure. But the first thing we're definitely going to do is to work on what was on our last agenda because we continued it in, in order to have that kind of discussion. So hopefully that will get back to the commission soon. Thanks. Mr. Marlick, I see your face. Did you want to say something on this item or are you gearing up for the next one? <laughs> no, I just wanted to remind commissioners that ad hoc committees are, are typically supposed to be single purpose committees. So um, with, you know, no more than six months in duration. So I'd recommend that, um, you know, perhaps you start work on the, uh, the FDU ordinance 
uh, conclude that work, report back to the commission so that we can keep that moving along, and then perhaps reestablish, you know, a committee for another single purpose, which would be Commissioner Conway's suggested um, ordinance. Well, um, certainly uh, not philosophically opposed to that, but I remember when the housing, when I first got on the commission, I think, and the housing subcommittee was first set up, it had about six or seven things that it was considering. So um, we'll take it a step at a time. I think the high priority now is the, um, is the uh, flexible density unit ordinance. Uh, and then maybe when we come back with that, we'll propose a, a work program along the lines that Commissioner Spellman has talked about and if necessary, reestablish the committee to carry out that work program. Okay, any problem with that? Any commissioners? Okay, then uh, hopefully we'll meet soon. <clears throat> Could I ask a question, Chair? Sure. At this juncture? So um, I believe that this will fall within the notice um, item on the agenda, but just since we didn't get a chance to discuss it at all last time, um, could you just sort of, from the commission, from the subcommittee members, I'd just be interested in hearing, like, what are the topics about FDUs that you're going to want to discuss so we can have a productive first meeting? We do want to kind of get that rolling as quickly as possible. So any, any issues or challenges or questions that you could kind of preview for us right now, we can start working on that so that our first meeting can really be a working meeting. Well, the one thing that I remember that I had a <clears throat> real concern about was what I understood to be the proposal to eliminate any density uh, limits on two-bedroom units. That, that's what stays in my mind. The rest of it is a blur, especially after all this objective standard stuff. I mean, I'm sure I'd get it all mixed up if I tried to come up with something else. Does any other commissioner have a um, an issue around that they want to, you know, sort of highlight around the flexible density unit. Okay. Does that give you a little something? It's a start. We'll work on, we'll, we'll be in touch to schedule a meeting. Okay, it's great. A very so important we'll move on question. to... <laughs> uh, it's a very important seven. question. I just want to say, Chair, like, why, why we have a committee to study this. There is a member of the public that had their hand raised to address the commission on this item. Oh, okay. So we're still on um, the housing subcommittee. We're after some and seals, go ahead. Given the lateness of the hour, you have two minutes. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I hope this won't take too much. Um, I just wanted to propose, you know, while you are um, you know, thinking about this uh, flexible density unit thing, you know, uh, at the last meeting um, we talked about uh, uh, looking closely at, at the, the parking requirement changes and, uh, you know, to the extent that there are other um, things that you're studying within the context of this, um, you know, you could be looking at uh, creating a ministerial approval process for flexible density units. Uh, you could be looking at um, zoning reform for flexible density units, um, uh, creating new transit corridors via upzoning um, along the um, the rail trail, perhaps. Uh, you could be looking at eliminating eliminating parking minimum requirements within a half mile of transit. Uh, you could be looking at uh, requiring unbundling parking. Um, you could be looking at uh, uh, you know a number of things, and and I just want to make sure that that uh, you know, in, in the context of this ordinance, that, that you are open to the possibilities of, of what you could do uh, to uh, produce more affordable housing in Santa Cruz. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Commissioner Greenberg? I just wanted to, um, to uh, appreciate that comment. There's, those are all great ideas, and I, I think that those are things that um, I'm glad it's recorded, and these are all, those are all things we can discuss. Thank you, Rafis, on this topic. Okay, so let's, if we can, move on to item number seven, the status of various projects. Um, and we do have a written staff report and a bunch of correspondence. So um, can we get the staff report? I'll then allow for commission questions and then open it up to the public. 
Sure. Um, I'll, there was a number of items that you had requested follow up on. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, meeting format and the downtown hotel. And then I'll turn it over to Sam to talk about the 100 Laurel and 324 Pennsylvania projects. And then um, uh, Matt Van Waal will, will conclude with the update on the UCSC LRDP process. Um, first, though, I wanted to um, mention as part of the updates, um, it was mentioned earlier that the 130 Center Street w uh, project was appealed to City Council. Um, that, that, in fact, is true. And we're targeting the December 14th. City Council agenda to hear that. So just a little update on that project. Um, as far as the meeting format um, issue goes, at your last meeting, you had some questions around whether the commission actually has the authority to decide meeting format or, or if it needs council approval. Um, I'll start by um, noting that as part of the city manager's report uh, at last week's city council meeting, um, there was a presentation on the move to hybrid meetings at the city council level um, that's expected to begin on November 23rd. Um, if you haven't watched it, I'd recommend that you do so. Um, it's both a technological as well as a labor intensive effort. Um, the, the expectation is, is that in the city council chambers, there'll be staff posted at each of the two entrances to um, check temperatures, look at proof of vaccination. Uh, perhaps a third uh, staff member um, from the fire department monitoring occupancy and social distancing. And then for those meetings where there's items of significant interest, um, there's a plan to use the Tony Hill room and the Civic for overflow, which also requires staffing to perform those very same functions. Um, so, you know, ultimately it's going to be a council decision as to, um, you know, whether this staff intensive operation um, will be extended to advisory bodies um, as there are budget implications to that. And, and the expectation is that um, all of the advisory bodies will be treated um, similarly. So, um, you know, if if you have hybrid meetings, and so will the Parks Commission, Public Works Commission, <laughs> et cetera. So um, council decision, that, uh, definitely. Um, I also want to note that um, that recently adopted AB 361 yeah. requires yeah. that in order to oh, hold you. or to continue to hold these yeah. virtual Public meetings um, during the state of emergency, yeah. the council must make <laughs> findings every 30 days that they're, they've reconsidered the circumstances of the state of emergency and that it continues to directly impact the ability of members to safely meet in person. So this applies to hybrid meetings also, um, as well as advisory bodies. So uh, my point is that the council is gonna be revisiting this every month. Um, in fact, at next week's council meeting, um, there's a resolution to that effect to, to have um, uh, 30 days of, of uh, hybrid meetings. Um, so that's the report on the meeting format. Um, for the downtown hotel, um, there was a, mem a memo in your packet that describes the project, the status, uh, as well as the entitlement process. Um, and then it also speaks a little bit to this general plan consistency determination that's associated with the sale of two city owned properties that are part of the project site. Um, this proposal, which was submitted last April, um, is to construct a six-story hotel with 232 rooms, a 50-foot wide paseo that connects Front Street to the levee and then other amenities. Um, there's a note in the memo that um, we have created a website um, that has the, the plans included in them. So um, if you're interested in looking at the details, it's, it's, it's all there. Um, that application has a number of entitlements that will ultimately require city council approval. It's currently incomplete, but um, we're getting pretty close to a completeness determination. Um, we're expecting that a community meeting will occur later this month. Um, and then hearings before the downtown commission and the planning commission can begin as early as December. Um, and then with respect to the, um, sale of city property, there, there is a provision in the government code that requires 
a planning agency to make a determination of general plan consistency generally within forty days of a referral by the city council which which hasn't yet occurred you'll recall at your last meeting you received correspondence from the building community not hotels organization suggesting that you direct staff to agendize this determination of we've we've also included this correspondence in the packet and the memo that's included your packet concludes that based on an analysis of the government code definition of planning agency the municipal code definitions or provisions that govern your body and then your bylaws that it's really this the staff's role in making this consistent consistency determination unless it's referred to you from the city council but just recently we came across a provision in the general plan that confirms that the city council has assigned the function of planning agency to the planning commission I knew it was somewhere I could not find it but I knew I had read it somewhere well we found it before you did I even looked in the general plan it's on page 10 if you want to if you want to check it out so so we're expecting that this item is going to be before the city council later in the year so at that point in time we're just going to inform the council that this consistency determination is going to be included on your agenda and that you know we'll be making a recommendation on it of course it could come independently of the project I mean ideally the timeline will work out so that we can have both the entitlement package as well as this consistency determination on the same agenda but it really depends on you know timing of completeness whether or not the applicants want to make any changes based on community input etc so so that's that's what's happening there I'll turn it over to Sam to talk to you about Laurel and Pennsylvania thank you good evening I just have a really quick update on I'll start with Pennsylvania so 418 Pennsylvania this was a project that was approved by the city council on appeal in February of this year and it included the demolition of an existing detached studio and the construction of three three-bedroom townhouses and that's on a site with an existing two-bedroom single-family dwelling that was remaining so four units total was the result and the project wasn't subject to any inclusionary requirement but there were specific conditions of approval on the project for replacement housing requirements and the way the income verification worked out the developer was required to provide one unit at 50% AMI in perpetuity so when the applicant submitted their building plans they requested that they construct an ADU in one of the garages and as you probably know the ADU ordinance changed dramatically over the last two years you can build ADUs on multifamily properties now or convert space with a ministerial permit only so in reviewing that plan we did receive comments from Mr. Spidell and I apologize if that's not how you pronounce his name regarding the feasibility of the ADU being the affordable replacement unit but at this time the property owner has decided to not construct the ADU and so they've decided to deed restrict the front two-bedroom unit instead the affordable housing agreement will identify that front unit as the specific affordable unit and the agreement is going to be required to be finalized prior to building permit issuance we have been in contact and in communication with Mr. Spidell and he's asked for us to provide him with updates and we will do so and I just want to reiterate that the applicant's decision to not build an ADU at this time does not preclude them from building an ADU in the future a multifamily site is eligible to construct two new construction and a conversion ADU up to 25% of the existing dwelling unit so they can provide one in this case and are there any I don't know if there's any questions on that 
Why don't we get through the whole staff report and then have questions on all of the projects? Okay. Chair, um, we need a motion um, to extend. Uh, to extend to adjourn to a time certain because it's 11 o'clock. Don't I like a mo uh, to make a motion to uh, go to 1130? I make a motion to go to 1115. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor? I'm gonna, well, I guess, do we need a roll call vote? Or can we just do that by, does anybody oppose? Why don't we do it by consensus? Okay, so um, we have a very quick um, 100 Laurel Street. Yes, Chair. Um, so that's the Pacific Front Laurel Project. Um, your question was that you had heard that they had um, uh, come into contact with problem. groundwater. Yeah. Um, there's no below grade parking at that site. The parking is all at grade um, and on the second level. Um, they did hit some groundwater in the basement of the um, Salvation Army building, but that has been filled at this time under the um, supervision of a soils engineer. Um, they are working on their drill displacement columns right now and um, that's all also under the supervision of the soils engineer. Um, and the building department says that the soils engineer is on site at all times, that they're drilling and that they have to reach um, a certain level of pressure and resistance before they can stop drilling. Um, so that level is varying between about 18 and 20 feet. Um, and if they hit water, then the water isn't providing that amount of resistance that they need, so they would need to drill down further. So, um, so no underground parking there, and um, all of the columns and work are being done under the direction of the soils engineer. Okay, thank you. Uh, Matt, did you want to say something very quickly about UCFC on the development plan? Yeah, this is just a brief update, Chair. Thank you. So in, in late September, the regents approved the LRDP and adopted the final EIR CEQA document. Um, and the city had provided comments on some potential issues that they, they found with that CEQA determination. So since that approval, the city has entered into a three-way tolling agreement between the university, the county, and the city. And uh, those issues noted by the city you know, should be resolved by the, by the end of January, because with the tolling agreement, the city has the ability to file a lawsuit by that date. Um, and as I understand now, the city, county, and university are just beginning the process of those negotiations. So that's the update for the item at this time. Thank you very much. Okay, let's have questions uh, from commissioners on any of these items. Uh, Commissioner Nielsen, I think I saw you first. Uh, yeah, I had a question on the Pennsylvania project. Um, so, and we got it. We did. But I think we saw a letter. Of course, we saw a letter from the public on this too. Um, so, the I understand what the the, the code is, or what the law is for ADUs, but I guess my question is around existing um, existing converting existing space. So, um, and. So I would just wonder, can you just explain kind of what, what the city stance is on that? Sure. Um, well, my understanding is that there's no direction from the state regarding the timing of a conversion ADU. So it's, it's sort of unclear whether, you know, what level of construction you need to get to before you can do an actual conversion of, of space into an ADU. Um, I mean, in this case, the concern was around um, the ADU being designated as the affordable unit. Um, and so the, I think the most effective way to get to that would be for your commission or, or the city council to be very specific about their preferences in the conditions of approval. Um, if the preference was to have a three bedroom unit be the deed restricted unit, then we could specify that in the condition. 
Okay. Dr. Spellman? Yeah, I wanted to follow up on that too. I mean, I think this has a lot broader implications as far as um, ADUs being allowed on new proposed projects, let's call it, right? Um, I mean, and it, as an example, you, you're building a small apartment project that has parking. Um, why couldn't that project design in the ADUs and be approved as opposed to waiting for construction? Um, in fact, I've been told that uh, by planning staff in, not the, in the not too distant past that that wasn't allowed, but now it sounds like the interpretation is leaning towards uh, entitlement, meaning you could have a design permit approval, and then between design permit and building permit, you could actually include the ADU and eliminate parking to do so. Is that, is that am I reading that right? Well, um, Eric, you can jump in on this if you like. Um, what our, and our thought process around it was that, yes, yeah, so why would we um, require someone to do a two-step process um, for an ADU that, you know, required to be a ministerial review? Um, and I think we probably need to put more thought into it and just make sure that our interpretation is accurate and see if we get any more um, direction from the state on that as well. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's the right way to go. I, mean, I think it's silly to, you know, build a new project knowing that you're going to convert it the minute it's done. I mean, that just makes no sense, right? And if we're going to get two new small units because of it, we should be encouraging that development as opposed to restricting it. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we think it makes sense from a, you know, a green building standpoint, a staff efficiency standpoint, you know, why should we go through two different plan checks? Um, there's all kinds of good, I mean, it's consistent with the state's goal of creating um, ADUs, um, but absent any, um, you know, state guidance on this, I mean, we, we think it's, it's probably a good idea that we should um, maybe come through with some clarification in our code. So as part of our um, annual uh, code update that we do where we do some cleanups, um, you know, if not before, we're likely to, you know, include this as a code amendment just so that everybody, so it's crystal clear and not, you know, just some staff interpretation. Sure. Okay. Yes. Commissioner Nielsen. I just, I, I mean, not opposed to the idea of, of what you, where you guys have landed necessarily, but I was kind of thinking about this in our last planning commission meeting when we were when 130 uh, Center Street was was brought to us, and I don't remember exactly how many units that that was, but let's say it was 100, 100. Let's just say it was 100 units. That means that 133. That means that they could for two. Okay, so 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 a quarter of that is you know 50, uh, 50 units, 50 plus units could be, you know, they, they could basically have wiped out the entire um, parking level, the first, the first level of parking, kept maybe the ground floor, I mean, the underground parking, um, and converted all of that to ADUs. So it's just something to think about. Because, and and um, because there is no, within the, within the law, there's, it's 25%, I mean, of, 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 converting of well, it's called existing space in the law. So just something to think about. I'm, I mean, I'm not, not saying I'm against it. It's just, um, I think it needs to be thought about in terms of how impactful that could be because it's, it's going to, it's, I mean, it's, it's going to add, you know, all these ADUs, which is great. And it's, it's, but it, but what it does is it, 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 it removes all that parking and brings in more housing with less, with less parking, you know, so it's just something to think about. Okay, um, let's hear from the public. I see two hands up. Um, given the fact that we're at 1110, we're supposed to end at 1115, I'm gonna give each speaker one minute. Uh, Micah Posner, you have a minute, go ahead. Can't hear you. You're speaking. Can 
Can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sorry, I took a bit there. Um, well, I was going to go on ad nauseum about why you are the planning agency, um, but it looks like staff found that in the charter, so that's great. I'll, I'll uh, skip all those comments. Um, I'll just speak more generally about the fact that, or my request that um, you really have a robust public process about the hotel. You know, make sure the public knows weeks in advance and not four days in advance. I want to point out that um, this project has been planned and supported by senior staff and at least one council member for more than two years before talking to the public in any way, shape, or form. That the city has made a consideration that um, this, these two parcels, which could obviously be used for housing, are deemed as affordable surplus, which goes against the spirit, if not the letter, of the affordable um, of the uh, Surplus Land Act in California. So this this project really needs some democracy. It really needs some some uh, openness to the public. Um, and I don't think the public wants a huge hotel there. So I'm just asking you guys as, as people that help the public understand planning and projects to, to make sure there's a robust process and that people know about it. So thanks for that. Thank you. Um, 426-3857, please introduce yourself in your one minute. Thank you. Um, it's very late. I'll just make this very short. I'm glad that the two commissioners uh, eyeballed the same discrepancy that I'm seeing here in that the plans that the city council and the planning commission look at with the public and debate about and finally approve or disapprove suddenly morph into something completely different when it gets to the very end of the planning process when the garages disappear and all of a sudden we have ADUs. And so what were we talking about in the first place back in the uh, commission hearing? It's just troubling. It's not very transparent, and I can't really believe it's what the state intended. Thank you, and good night, people. Good night. Thank you. Um, Rafa Sonnenfeld, you have one minute. Thank you. Um, uh, my comment also had to do with the um, proposed uh, surplus uh, parking lot. And um, it was my understanding that that still had to come back to council for a determination to um, uh, to do the surplus uh, land. Um, and and so far, the direction of staff was just to um, conduct uh, you know the feasibility or or whatever sort of process that had to go along with that. Um, so I, I hope that there is more opportunity for um, for the public to and for the the city to um, Put conditions or 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 review that process before it is before it is um, finalized. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got two minutes. I, I do. Commissioners have any responses to the staff report? Yes, Commissioner Nielsen. I, I don't necessarily have a response to the staff report. I just have a actually a quick question, Mr. Marlat, based on his uh, the, what he led with. I was curious if. What, if you knew what the grounds were for the appeal of 130 Center Street? Um, I didn't look at it in any great detail. I know that there were some um, uh, some claims that it was inconsistent with certain general plan policies. Um, there were also some um, concerns um, regarding the amount of traffic that the project would generate. Um, Sam, did you have anything to add on that? Um, yeah, I think it was mostly based on traffic and I think that there, there might have been a claim that it was inconsistent with the CEQA exemption as well. All right, thank you. I have two comments I'd like to make, one having to do with the uh, hotel. I think it would be really desirable to have the consistency come at the same time as the project. Uh, rather than go through two separate processes at the commission for a project that's going to be very controversial, um, if we only hang, if we can hear it once, I think that would really be desirable. So if there's any way to make that happen, I would really like to advocate for that. My second that, that's comment our goal too. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my second thing, uh, point has to do with the 418 Pennsylvania. My concern with that, particularly, I understand and appreciate the other points. I don't think ADU should be allowed as affordable units. I mean, the whole 
rationale behind ADUs is they're supposed to be more affordable. And therefore, I think we need to think about whether it should be made clear that um, the inclusionary requirements are met, are met by uh, project units, not by ADUs. And I, I appreciate staff's suggestion that the uh, inclusionary units be identified in the <clears throat> in the conditions, but it's always it's not always possible to do that, uh, particularly for larger projects. So I think we need. A, I would hope we would think about whether we would want to get some provision in the inclusionary ordinance. At least I would support a provision that would um, not not use ADUs to meet inclusionary requirements. It seems a contradiction. So if there are no other comments, we've exceeded our time by a minute. Commissioner Spellman. I would just be careful there. I think it's worth further study. With potentially an ADU is going to be much larger than typical units in a project. <laughs> well, that's true, too. <laughs> okay, but I'm, I'm raising a, a general concern. I think if we get into it, we should talk about those concerns. Um, any other comments on information items? Uh, subcommittee or advisory body or reports, there are none. Are there any items to be referred to future agendas? Seeing none, uh, I want to, unless there are any final comments, I want to thank everybody for hanging in there. We got through our agenda and we are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. You.